Hello everyone, it's Jay and Andy here again with another episode of The Rating Room Revisited. That's right. This week we're jumping from 1973 all the way to 1987 for the debut of Timothy Dalton as 007. Before that, Roger Moore played James Bond until well into his 50s. Do you think he stayed in the role too long, Jay? I do. I do think he, he stayed in the role too long. He, he's too old, and this is where... We, we've mentioned on our James Bond looking forward who's going to be the next James Bond actor where they need to get the age of the actor right with the new James Bond. Could we, I personally don't want to see another situation with Roger Moore where he stayed maybe one, two more films than he should have done. I think personally he could probably... I I personally would have said for your eyes only would have been a good ending for Roger Moore that said would Timothy Dalton be able to do Octopussy in a view to a kill I don't know is my honest answer but I do think he should have finished one definitely two films early is my is my opinion Andy what about you do you think he he stayed around too long I think he did but I think A View to a Kill was a pretty good way to finish. It would have just been nicer for a younger Roger Moore to have taken that role. Maybe that could have been his fifth film four or five years earlier. That would have been a good way to end. But um, James Bond in his mid to late 50s, it's not really right, is it? It's a young man's game. It is a young man's game. And this is where they... they yeah, like I said, they really need to get their casting right because... Do they go for a younger Bond where they kind of they kind of done it with Daniel Craig where they're kind of going back to the beginning where he's a rookie but is obviously Daniel Craig was older or do they kind of carry on doing what they've been doing and go for more an established Bond from there. There's different viewpoints obviously. Plenty of options and as of recording we still don't know what those options are but uh, hopefully we'll find out sooner rather than later. But when Roger Moore's time was finally over, it was Dalton that took the mantle. So Jay, what did you think of Dalton as James Bond? When we started doing the podcast, these were the two films that I was just not looking forward to watching. I remember watching these a few times and I remember just thinking, oh, I don't like the Timothy Dalton films. I don't, I'm not looking forward to this period um, at all. But I was pleasantly surprised, actually, even though they were nowhere near my top films, they were actually ranked higher than I expected. So that was surprising. And I don't know what your feelings are about this, Andy, because I think this is, depends if you class Roger Moore as a reboot. You know how we mentioned last week in last week's episode, I said, Roger Moore, where they've gone for the more light-hearted, you know, you mentioned comedic, loving type of Bond. Is that a reboot or, or not? Whereas this felt like a, a reboot for me, like a mini reboot, because they've gone for a complete change to Roger Moore's camp Bond to a serious and gritty Dalton Bond, which is more like the Ian Fleming novels. I would say more a reimagination purely because they continued the story arc from, well, from Connery and Lazenby, didn't they, with um, Roger Moore at the graveside of Tracy Bond, and it's alluded to in the Dalton film as well that, you know, he's had a terrible loss. So not not a reboot, but I understand what you mean. I would say just a a, a, re, a rethink or a reimagination of, of who and what Bond is. No, that, that's a valid point, Andy. Um, yeah, that is probably the right word to use, actually, reimagine. And Dalton, now, I think you could argue this point. I think Dalton is probably the most accomplished actor before Bond. You could argue Roger Moore did a lot of TV. He was a TV star. Others might argue Daniel Craig and even Connery are maybe better actors than Dalton. I think these three are the ones that stand out for me. Um, also, another thing is... And I'm thinking back to the the opening pre-title sequence, Andy, and I think it's one of your favourites from memory as well, with, you know, Gibraltar Rock, I think it was. It was indeed, yeah, a very memorable and impactful debut. 
Yeah, and Dalton did tend to do a lot of his stunts as well, which does add to the making it more feel more authentic as well. And I kind of mentioned this a few minutes ago, but the the grittiness of Dalton is definitely kind of the the edginess and also Lazenby did it as well, but Dalton did have this kind of emotional depth as well. And obviously he has this kind of revenge um, mission as well in License to Kill, you know, with Felix and his wife um, as well. And also with Kara in The Living Daylights, where he's getting attached to Kara as well. So you've got that bit diff um, is very different to the Roger Moore and Sean Connery Bond films. And the last point, Andy, before I pa um, pass over to you is disappointing box office performances. As we've mentioned, no James Bond film has bombed in the box office, but the two Dalton films performed um, weaker than expected. So that doesn't help his case. But my last closing statement, Andy, when I think of Dalton, I can't really think of many iconic scenes or even one-liners for me for Dalton. What's your thoughts of Dalton and his, his two films that he did? So going into this, I would say these were probably the ones I was most looking forward to watching, but because they were the they were the ones that I least remembered. And there's a lot of love for Jay, um, excuse me. There's a lot of love for Dalton as Bond on things like the the James Bond subreddit and and other platforms. And uh, he seems to be getting his flowers, as the kids might say, these days. So I wanted to see if he really did live up to the hype because I just I just couldn't remember. There wasn't didn't go with any preconceived notion it was just a, a couple of films that i remember the least i agree with you about the grittiness the edginess the emotional side of things that he brought to the role for me though it was too inconsistent i think he was trying to add layers to the role and i think daniel craig actually took a lot of inspiration from the way dalton played the role he just did it much better but dalton was a little bit too inconsistent with his portrayal. Maybe he needed another film or two to just kind of really establish himself, but um, of the six actors that played the role, he was my least favourite. Not He wasn't bad, he just wasn't great. He was, yeah, I was, I was disappointed um, in his portrayal. Yeah, on my pre-chart rankings he was actually ranked bottom but i think my argument was to put him above jules lazenby on this rewatch was that he had two films whereas lazenby only had the one so it was hard to do but i would say and i stand by this point i would gladly give up one of dalton's films to have another lazenby film i'd, I'd gladly swap that around because i do think lazenby um if if you were comparing if they both had the same number of films i would i would prefer to pick up the laser me film over either the dalton films it's an interesting trade i was thinking maybe an extra brosnan or bring brosnan in sooner brosnan yeah i would if we, if people argue about having dalton as more uh, dalton films i would i would be willing to um stand my ground and say you couldn't take any of the Brosnan films off of Brosnan you would have to take it off of Roger Moore but like I said um, earlier I couldn't see Dalton doing A View to a Kill or Octopussy they would have to do some rejigging with the script for those two. Oh yes I would, I would tend to agree with that or maybe a brand new unbefore un before scene is that a word? It yeah. is now or just write a new film. A brand, and just brand, new, it. brand new Bond, yeah. Papa's yeah. got a brand new Bond. This was a difficult time, wasn't it, with Bond, actually? You know, because of the... We're going to have the delays as well with, before Brosnan. We've had Roger Moore um, staying in the role for so long. Dalton came in, did two films, disappointing box office performances. This is probably, looking at it now, is probably the, the point that was... I would say most threatening to the franchise or you could argue even now as of today is in terms of where we are those are the two points i think in time with the franchise 
with Dalton during the eighties before it goes to Bosnia and that delay and where we are now? Uh, I would tend to agree. I think the the legal challenges that happened in the background. I think there was a chain. Was there a change of production company or? Um, there some, yeah, there were issues there with I, yeah the producers and stuff. Is, yeah. it, is it this film or is it License to Kill that none of it was filmed in the UK because of these kind of troubles? So they had to fill it entire film it entirely on location outside of the UK. I could neither confirm or deny that fact. Andy, we may have we may have touched upon memory. it in in season one, so you may hear it, listeners, in in the next few minutes as as the episode rolls, or you may not. And if you've not, that means it's the other film. <laughs> so sorry, I know we're just choking with laughter. Then <laughs> <laughs> I muted myself, so the listeners would have not heard that, or they might hear it if you decide to leave it in the edit with me choking to death. Is there anything, Andy, you want to cover that's Dalton related before we kind of? So just just any kind of closing statements to Dalton uh, as a whole is there any other standout films that you you know that I might have not seen or you would recommend to anyone that having only seen Dalton in two James Bonds you say you need to check this film out I'm I'm, I'm not overly familiar with Dalton's work to be honest I think he's done some TV and some theatre work and he's been in a handful of films the only the other film that really comes to mind right now is the one he did with Simon Pegg and Nick Frost is it the world's end yes yeah, yeah that's uh, right, but of yeah. course he was in the toy story franchise as well which we've he talked was, about yes. in recent weeks now toy toy story i would definitely recommend not necessarily for dalton but uh very good series of films well yes they are and i was having an of office discussion about our episode about toy story andy only this week because the person who was listening to the episode um, agreed and said Toy Story was very good. However, she said for her Shrek was the the best animated franchise, and the first two Shreks kind of hands down beat anything. Because I was saying she she wasn't aware that they were making a, or going to make a Toy Story five, and we were just talking about you know our viewers or whether that kind of ran its course. So yeah, nice link in there with our episode for season two there you go if we ever do a six degrees of dalton and have to link it to shrek this is the episode we can we can visit <laughs> so before we sign off let's just remind the listeners of what we can expect over the coming weeks andy yeah so over the past few weeks obviously you've heard the rating room revisited and we're talking about the debuts of the james bond actors so we've got two more to follow after this brosnan and craig then we're going all new rating room content we're going to have what at the minute is penciled in as season three but we've got new formats new films new ideas maybe even a little bit of tv for the first time on the podcast so check that out plus loads of other content on our social media channels guest interviews clips news all the usual stuff on on the social media follow us on at the rating room on all the usual platforms but uh, should we get back into signing off for this week? Yeah, so thanks, Andy. So that's everything. Andy covered us there very comprehensively. So right now, let's get back to Season 1, Episode 15. This is The Living Daylights. This is episode 15, The Living Daylights. James Bond finds himself helping a Soviet general escape from the Iron Curtain, only to see a cellist holding a rifle on his subject. When the general is recaptured, Bond decides to track him by finding out why a concert cello player would try and kill her benefactor. He escapes with her first to Vienna, then to Morocco, finally ending up in a prison in Soviet-occupied Afghanistan, where he tracks down elements in this mystery. So, Jay... What did you remember about this before you rewatched it again recently? So Andy, I've got to be honest here. When we started talking about doing the podcast for James Bond, there was two films that I wasn't really looking forward to watching. It was The Living Daylights 
and license to kill. That is kind of setting the scene, just so you know, because I don't think we really um, discussed this. So in terms of the actual film, I remembered that there was a a Bond girl playing a musical, musical instrument, but I couldn't quite remember what the musical instrument was. I remembered Brad Whitaker. I remembered the main henchman. I didn't quite remember his name, but I remembered what he looked like. Also remembered, obviously, this is Timothy Dalton's first film. And for me, I remember the the main villain. So I couldn't remember his name, but I was, obviously it's Koskoff. I remember him being quite underwhelming, quite weak. And also the the pipe escape too, in terms of getting Koskoff out of the Soviet Union. What about you, Andy? What What did you remember this week? That's some good recall, Jay. For me, I don't remember anything about the story, about the characters. There was just two things that came to mind. One was I remembered Bond on a horse in Afghanistan, which is I know is a very random fact to remember. And I'm also wondering now whether I remembered it from the film or whether it's something I saw in a documentary fairly recently. So it's maybe clouded my judgment. But the one thing I do definitely remember is Bond driving a shed i use the word shed in inverted commas but there's a scene where he's in the snow and he drives into some sort of wooden shed and the shed goes with him as he carries on driving so it is like he's driving a shed but that's all i remember in terms of the film i don't remember anything storyline or character related at all so andy sorry um i know this is unscripted but in terms of the two timothy dalton films do you remember much of them or do you kind of in terms of thinking oh that bit was definitely this film and that bit was definitely the other film or is it a bit of kind of jumbled up between the two films that he did i think it's a little bit jumbled but i am more confident about my memories of this film than i am when we discuss next week's episode license to kill which um spoiler alert my memories are zero (laughs) but let's um Let's get into some of the information. So you mentioned one of the names earlier, but the main villains, there are General George I. Koskov, Brad Whitaker, and Necros. And just the two Bond girls in this one, Cara Milavoy and Linda. Yeah, and the theme song this week is The Living Daylights by Aha. The opening credits, so there's a, there's you know a lot of stuff that we're seeing now you know repeated in these Bond opening credits. So in The Living Daylights, we've got the shooting gone again. We've got 007 writing kind of shoots out of the gun. We've got model a model wearing glasses that has a video of Bond and a woman in them. We've got the usual dancing models, shimmering water. We've also got in this one, the red and blue filters being applied to some of the opening scenes as well. And then we've got a model lying down in water. So some of these are quite consistent with the previous week's episodes that we've seen in the opening credits. In terms of the body count, so these are James Bond kills only. So unlucky for some, it's 13 in Timothy Dalton's opening movie. So not bad. It's, it's quite the violent start that he has to life as Bond. Gadgets. Usually we have an array of gadgets. Not so much in this film. We do see a couple of gadgets at Q Branch, but Bond only uses one, and that's a keychain. The introduction of Bond, James Bond, happens very early in the film, just 7 minutes and 24 seconds in. We do have a martini, and it is shaken, not stirred, as Bond very explicitly points out in one scene. And we, what we don't have is any hat wearing or hat throwing. Do you think that's it now in terms of hat wearing and hat throwing? Because I don't think Timothy Dalton's a hat wearing type of Bond. I tend to agree. I'm thinking, you know, thinking weeks ahead, we've got Dalton to to view. We've got fewer Brosnan and we've got Daniel Craig. None of them strike me as hat wearers. So this could be the end of the hats. But we'll know soon enough. Yeah, tune in to, you know, make sure you track that with us as well. I can imagine Daniel Craig wearing a little um, flat cap. Peaky Blinders style. like a. Yes, I can imagine him wearing that. I can't remember if he, he wears that in Bond. But for some reason, I'm kind of getting that visual. So I don't know if he does it in another film. 
or in a Bond film. But yeah, I can't imagine Timothy Dalton wearing a hat. And from memory, I don't think Bosnian does. But obviously, yeah, tune in and, you know, find out with us. Indeed. I'm, I'm sceptical on the flat cap. Uh, but, Jay, let's, let's get into the, the film in a little bit more detail. Tell me, what was your favourite scene? And yeah, I struggled with this one this week because I was... We watched a film on Friday night typing up the notes on Saturday and just doing a bit of research and I was thinking what what is my favorite scene and then I was thinking you know looking through the notes at various scenes that we've had and nothing really jumped out whereas you know when you know in previous episodes I think for me it's been quite easy for the majority of films not every film to be honest but the majority of films I think oh yeah you know it, it's definitely that one whereas this one I'm thinking oh you know what is it and in the end i think the one that probably stuck out the most and i don't know if it's because it happens at the end is the the big fight scene you know with the airfield and it transitions to the the airplane as well where bond is you know escaping with the the explosives and obviously has his fight with necros as well so that is probably the one that i think is probably my favorite what about you andy I think the ending scene was very good, very strong, but I actually preferred the opening scene. So when, uh, this is pre-credits, so in, in Gibraltar, the, the chase scene, I thought that was fantastic. And I, I dare say, one of the strongest openings to a Bond film that we've seen so far. And at this, you know, we're, we're going to talk ratings very shortly. But at this point, when I saw that first scene into the credits... I was very excited thinking this is going to be one of those classic Bond films. So we've gone for complete opposites. We've gone for the bookends of the film. I, I like a strong start. You like a, a strong finish. Yeah, and I did like the bit about the opening. Obviously, we're going to talk about the opening in a few minutes. I like how, how they kept him... Oh, I don't know if it's mysterious is the right word, but they didn't reveal him straight away because you didn't know which one was Bond out of the... the, the you know, the the double O agents that jumped out of the, the plane, did you? Because you never actually saw their faces. So I like that, how it was building up the, the tension. And from memory, they did something similar with George Lazenby, didn't they? When he's driving the car, had a focus on certain bits of him before they did the, the reveal of the face. They did, yeah. They had, um, if memory serves me correctly, he was driving a car. Or a man dressed quite smartly was driving a car that then turned out to be bond and in this case there was three men all dressed in identical gear one of which turned out to be bond so yeah very very clever way of kind of keeping the audience in suspense another question i've got for you jay which we ask every week how many times did you reach for your phone while you were watching this this week again it was zero but i must admit i was tempted a few times i, I went for my phone at least two or three times, but I didn't actually um, flick the screen on, so my hand was moving for it. But I thought, no, I want to like you know keep watching it just in case I miss anything. What about you, Andy? Were you disciplined this week? I was zero for me as well, but I have to agree. I was I was tempted to distract myself at points, which leads us very nicely on to what was your rating, the all important rating for this film. So I've gone in at 6 out of 10, which I think is quite respectable. What was yours? And then I just want to kind of add something to my bit after. So what did you give it out of 10? So I mentioned a minute ago that this, the opening scene was very, very strong. And I was really excited at this point. My excitement didn't last, to be honest. I think I, it peaked too soon and then the excitement faded away. Such is life. So I went in with a 5 out of 10. Slightly disappointing, I would say. Yeah, so the, the thing I wanted to kind of go back on to Andy was, you know, any listeners out there, they might be on Reddit and they might be on the James Bond subreddit. And as I was mentioning to Andy before, and there's, there's a lot of love for the Timmy, Timothy Dalton films on the James Bond subreddit. You know, a lot of people state that in his version of Bond, it's a lot grittier. And it's, it's kind of influenced, I think you said, Andy, that Daniel Craig took some of his inspiration from... The Timothy Dalton films. So when I was about to rewatch this, I was thinking, oh, you know, maybe my memory of the Timothy Dalton films 
is a bit skewed. This this is you know going to come out quite high. You know I'm thinking seven or eight. So I was a bit disappointed in terms of it wasn't as good as everyone was saying on the James Bond subreddit. But like I said, it was better than what I remembered it was. And watching it, Andy, and you know we'll talk about it a bit more detail when we start actually talking about you know the actual film. He is very different to the previous actors we've seen so far, isn't he? He is, yeah. He's he's a very different's the word. I I think in some ways it was quite an original portrayal, and and I don't know if this is the right time to say it, but let's let's just go in with all guns blazing, early doors. I think his portrayal was very inconsistent, and I think the the moments he was good, he was great, but there weren't enough of those moments, and there were other other times where he was let down. By either his performance, maybe it was a, maybe it was scripting, but the, it just felt off. It just didn't feel right overall. But there were glimpses where you think this this could be fantastic, but it just didn't last. Because there were certain bits in there where it was you could imagine, and I don't think this was the case, but some of the dialogue you would have imagined Roger Moore's version of Bond saying, and not it didn't the way you're saying. So I think some of it, were, well, a lot of it was gritty, but then there were certain elements where you think, oh, that sounds like kind of a, a Roger Moore's portrayal of Bond, a bit more light-hearted. Yeah, I would agree with that. And but I think it went too far in both directions. It didn't. It didn't have that overlying tone of of consistency. Like with the with the Connery film, you knew what you were getting with Connery, and he he stayed stayed in his lane. And similarly with Roger Moore, although he portrayed it in a different way, it was a very identifiable Roger Moore portrayal. Whereas Dalton had the hard edge, but then the softness, and then the, there was a bit of silliness. And it was it was like, well, which way are you going with Bond? Because it sounds like it was it was just it it didn't have a a clear defined direction for me, and it was like he was still trying to figure out who his version of James Bond is, if that makes sense. It does make sense. But I've got one more question, Andy, before we move on, is we, we've said before that sometimes a Bond could be, a, you know, a, an actor portraying Bond could be good in a bad film or a vice versa. That could be a good film and the Bond actor might not necessarily have been the best. So do you think, from your point of view, I suppose there's two questions here. The Living Daylights with a act, different actor that we've had so far, so, you know, Connery, Lazenby, or more, do you think the film would have been scored higher? And then flip that, if Timothy Dalton was in an earlier film, do you think he might have scored higher? Two interesting questions. And I tend to think that this film would have been better as a Connery film. Would be my... Or even, you know, if we're, if we're going forwards, I could see a Craig in this film. But let's let's stick to the chronological order. Up to this point, if your choices are Connery, Lazenby, Moore, Dalton, this feels like it would have been better as a Connery film because of the edgy elements to it. And I think, to, to your second question, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of Moonraker. A terrible, terrible Bond film, but not the fault of Roger Moore, really. Whereas I think my rating for this film was quite heavily influenced by Dalton's portrayal. And I think he let the film down in places, in my opinion. Obviously not in the opinion of many, many Redditors. <laughs> now, I, I definitely agree on your that first part, Andy. I think Sean Connery... Um, would have been very strong in this film and might have moved it up a, a point or two. And then Timothy Dalton, I was thinking a view to a kill. I was thinking, you know, in terms of instead of Roger Moore, maybe if he, maybe Timothy Dalton in that. That was obviously last week's episode. I think he might have moved it up a, a point or two as well. But that's our opinion. What was your wife's opinion of this film? So she... She thought it was too long and 
she she thought it was very slow at the beginning but obviously which is it kind of goes against what you said in terms of um you peaked early and then obviously it went down whereas the missus felt it was definitely too long and very slow at the beginning but i could tell you know because i'm sat with her i could see at the beginning you know she was on a phone a bit but that second half the phone went down and she was like really engaged watching it because i thought it was going to be one of those instances andy where we paused it and then watched an hour in one night and an hour on the other night, you know, Saturday, because I could see she was flagging at the beginning. But yeah, it got to a certain point. I can't remember when, but it was definitely like, you know, near the, the middle where she was definitely more engaged. Cause I said, oh, do you want to stop it and carry on watching it tomorrow? She said, no, 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 it's getting good now. But she did think Timothy Dalton was a good Bond. She said, obviously, Roger Moore is old now and it was nice to see a, a younger actor portray James Bond and also from a physical point of view she said that he, he fitted the kind of James Bond type in terms of his physique uh, as well and she mentioned um, quite a sh strong jawline as well so from from a visual point of view visual point of view she was happy as well so yeah she she did, yeah, she did enjoy this film. And the last few films, that, you know, I mentioned last week's episode where she was on the phone a lot, falling, you know, dropping off to sleep. But she, she definitely um, engaged more with this. And, you know, in the in some of the notes that we've got, she's, you know, she's fed back and picked out some good points as well. What about you, Andy? Did, um, did you get your better half into Bond yet? So the slightest of slight progress here she did watch around 90 seconds of the film so this this is a good start it was an accident she just happened to be in the room at the time um and she asked which film it was i said it was living daylights and timothy dalton and she made a comment and we're kind of jumping to sort of the middle of the film here but she men made a comment about how bond smile was really cheesy and this was a bit during the uh, horse and cart scene with bond and cara later on but she felt he had a really cheesy smile, which is a very odd comment, I think, for for someone to make about James Bond. Very odd. Yeah, I I agree, Andy. And I thought that was quite a good scene. That brought back memories of Bond and, you know, Tracy in A Majesty's Secret Service where they're doing that montage. If she didn't like that bit, Andy, I don't think she's not going to like any of it. Yeah, I I mean, I didn't like that bit. We'll We'll talk about that later, but I completely get your point. I just didn't like it. I was surprised when I saw that you wrote about um, the missus watching it, Andy. I managed to give her 90 seconds of pleasure out of the last 15 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a personal best, isn't it, Andy? It's, it's getting there, yeah. Getting there. We'll, we'll aim for two minutes next week and I'll report back <laughs> and see, see how I got on. But let's, uh, let's not digress any further. We're bringing the tone down few facts about the film. Uh, runtime, two hours, ten minutes. Again, we're in that consistent kind of two hours and a bit window. Film was released in 1987, and John Glenn is back at the helm. It's fourth Bond film in a row. Yeah, that's impressive so far. And I was six years old, Andy, when this came out. So, a Bond of my childhood now. How old were you? Were you about three? I turned three in 87, so this would, I would have been two at the time it was released. Okay, just to make our listeners feel old or maybe make us feel old, depending on the age group of our listeners. I was going to say, weren't you about 25 when this one came out? <laughs> so obviously no one can see us because this is an audio podcast at the moment, but I'm the Roger Moore of our team aren't i andy and what would you say you are i'm probably i'm probably the dalton i'm the weak link <laughs> i disagree andy so moving on let's just talk about some general points before we kind of get deeper into the film so as i like to kick off with the general points let's talk about the budget and the box office stats for the living daylights so the budget was $40 million, which makes it the most expensive Bond film so far in the franchise. That $40 million, Andy, got you got your 5 out of 10. So not value for money there, is it, really? $8 million per rating point. 
That's, uh, that's not a good return. No, no, it's not a good return. But what is not bad return, but, you know, not good in terms of the franchise is the, the box office stats. So when it came out, it took $191.2 million. So when you adjust it for inflation, that's 487.8 million, which means it's the second worst performing box office performance so far in the franchise when you adjust it. The lowest return has been last week's episode, which was A View to a Kill. So we've had two back-to-back poor performing films, which from memory, Andy, must be a first so far in the franchise. I think so, yeah. But I do wonder how much of this was influenced by the economy at the time. So um, it's it's one of those interesting metrics that we're tracking, but could obviously be interpreted in, in a couple of different ways. But, uh, but yeah, for looking at today's standards... It's pretty low down and the chart's still very profitable, has to be said. So another interesting talking point is the Aston Martin makes the return to the franchise after an 18 year absence. And this one is pretty special. We've got tire spikes, we've got missiles, we've got lasers, we've got a missile guidance display, we've got a self-destruct timer. So Aston Martin have really gone with all the bells and whistles for their triumphant return. You know, thinking about Bond cars and my dad is a big Aston Martin fan. If you ask my dad about bond cars, he would say like the Aston Martin, but obviously we've not had it for 18 years and it's not something I personally have really picked up on. I, I think of the Aston Martin as the quintessential bond car. But, but I have to say, I, I don't feel like we've missed it. I think we've had... I mean, the one that sticks in my mind as being a suitable replacement is the Lotus Esprit, which we've seen, I think, in a couple of different films, haven't we? So, you know, that's that's more than a handy replacement for the Aston Martin but yeah when, when I think Bond car I think Aston Martin regardless of film so it's it's nice to have it back that's for sure uh, another thing that we may have touched on in a previous episode is the fact that Timothy Dalton was originally considered for the role of Bond to replace Sean Connery but he ruled himself out because he thought he was too young he was only 24 or 25 at the time so looking back to 1973 which was Roger Moore's first outing the Bond franchise could have taken a very different path had Timothy Dalton stepped in at that point yeah and I know you know both of our feel you know, in terms of the scoring of the films the majority of the Roger Moore films we have scored quite low compared to the Connery films and I know at least two you scored quite highly of the Moore films from memory I think the franchise would have been very different if Dalton, well, if, if Roger Moore never got to play Bond in the franchise and Dalton had the Roger Moore film, I think it would be a very different franchise and not necessarily one that I would have enjoyed because I quite like the light-hearted approach that Roger Moore brought to Bond, even though, like I said, we haven't scored his films, the majority of his films as high as Connery films. I still think Roger Moore played a good Bond, even though he did a, a different type of version. As we said in previous episodes, he's more the lover type of Bond instead of the killer. Yeah, and I think what, what's also interesting is how would Dalton have developed as Bond given more time in the role? Because obviously he's in this week and next week's episode of the podcast, so therefore he's only in two films. And there was a quote by... I, I want to say broccoli. I could be wrong, but it's certainly someone associated with the Bond film who said basically that you need three films to really establish yourself as a Bond. And of course, Dalton only got two. So are, are we judging him unfairly? And let's go back to Sean Connery. The third film was Goldfinger, an absolute classic. Still in our ratings up to now, top of the pile. And that was his, that was the magic third film, so... Maybe Dalton just needed a little bit more time. Maybe, maybe Andy. And thinking back to our earlier conversation about whether Timothy Dalton playing a different, playing Bond in a different film, the gritty version of Timothy Dalton would have been great in Diamonds Are Forever. Yeah, that's that's a good shout. That would have been a a really good debut film, actually. Uh, one one final point, just kind of continuing this, is that he was considered again when Roger Moore decided to leave prior to For, For Your Eyes Only. Um, and it, it was all but signed, sealed and delivered, but Moore changed his mind at the last minute. 
So more carried on for a few more films. Dalton began filming Brenda Starr. And could it could only do The Living Daylights if the Bond producers waited for six weeks. That is an interesting little tidbit. And Andy, I just wanted to go back to your point where you said, was it Broccoli said about needing free films? I think so. I could be wrong on that, but um, I, I heard that somewhere in the deep recesses of my mind. I just had a look at Roger Moore's third film, which is The Spy Who Loved Me, and I have that as the highest rated Roger Moore film on my list. And obviously, with you've said Goldfinger is the highest rated Bond film, but also obviously therefore the highest rated Sean Connery film. So there's a bit of logic there. Will it hold up, though, in Brosnan and Daniel Craig films? That is a very interesting question, and I guess we'll find out in our The World Is Not Enough and Skyfall episodes. Yeah, so moving on, both Sam Neill and Pierce Brosnan were screen-tested for the role of James Bond in The Living Daylights. Brosnan was successful and signed for the role, but due to his contract with the television programme Remington Steel, he had to withdraw from the, the Bond franchise and... Obviously, he ends up waiting seven years for his second chance in GoldenEye. So there's a bit of a recurring theme there, Andy, in terms of the producers going back for the the right actor. Yeah, they have to wait, but eventually they get their man. I I could be wrong on this, but I I think this is a fact that Brosnan not only screen tested, but was also involved in various photo shoots in the tuxedo and with the gun, and promotional material was being readied with his image. That's how close he was to playing the role. Yeah, Brosnan, if he, if he did obviously play um, Bond in The Living Daylights, he would have had an extra two films in the, the Bond franchise. And Andy, would have that made him the, the longest serving Bond then in terms of films? You're, you've got a better memory than me. So Brosnan did four. This, these two would have made six. So he would have been level with Connery, but one behind more. That's why we need your knowledge on this podcast, Andy. You are the James Bond ex- expert. We are, we are two halves of the same brain. We we complement <laughs> each other. Another way of looking at that is is we both only have half a brain. <laughs> yes. Um, moving on. So this is the second time we see M in his Royal Navy uniform. So the first time was in You Only Live Twice when he wore it in the when he wore the Royal Navy Whites with the old insignia board. So, yeah, he's he's in his uniform. Yep, this was the uniform. I'm very dapper he was looking too, it has to be said. And uh, we don't see it very often. It's not like we see it in every film. But we are reminded that there is a a naval element to this as well as the Secret Service because, of course, Bond is a commander in the Navy. So there's um, a nice little callback every so often to see that. Yeah, you're right, because obviously Bond is the majority of it the time he's in his civilian clothes, I suppose you would call it. But yeah, there are instances where he's in um, the Royal Navy uniform. And obviously, you know, last week he was rocking a leather jacket, wasn't he, as well? So Yeah, he was full on Alan Partridge last week, wasn't he? <laughs> the rain room. Let's, let's move on. Let's talk about some goofs and continuity errors. So the first one, more of a plot hole rather than a, a continuity error, I would say. And, and the question is, how did Necros know that Bond and Saunders were meeting at the CAF? So Saunders suggested a meeting t- place and time only a few hours earlier, and it was kept strictly between him and Bond. But yeah, he somehow knew. There's a scene in, in Tangier where Whitaker tells Necros to kill another British agent. It takes place on the same day that Bond arrived in Vienna. So that means that Necros must have got from Tangier to Vienna, tracked down Saunders, acquired the materials to booby trap the cafe doors, and set up the trap well in advance of him and Bond getting to the fairground. So there's a lot of time gone by, including uh, a five hour plus flight in there as well. So that's that's a lot of ground to cover without him knowing or seemingly not knowing that that was going to take place. So that that just seemed a little bit odd. That is a little bit odd. And that is, you know, when we had that scene and he, he booby-trapped the glass doors, I did think, how how did he know he was going to be in there? But I didn't spend too much time thinking about it in the film. 
I knew that because I kind of remembered, you know, we've had it in the past where certain scenes have started and that kind of recalled, you know, rejig down memory. And I remember that was going to happen. But I did think, how, how, how did he know to set, you know, set that bomb there? It, it didn't quite make sense. It's either extremely good planning or it's, I, I don't know what it is, pure luck. Mm. You know, has, has he got 200 cafes booby trapped just in case? <laughs> Who knows? But logistically, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, moving on, a factual error. In the Soviet base in Afghanistan, the equipment from the armoured carriers to the light tanks are all French manufactured. And the transport plane is an American plane, the C-130 Hercules. It's a little bit of, um, I, don't, I don't know what the, what the term is, but some very unlikely international trading, I would say, is going on there. Yeah, that's definitely a, a factual error slash goof, you could say. It's not a continuity error, but it's a bit of a goof. Yeah, it is. All those pieces don't really fit together. Um, another one to, to bear in mind as well is uh, Bond in his final conversation with Whitaker empties his PPK. That's him. Hits the gun shield on Whitaker's weapon five times and it remains undamaged. But Whitaker rounds the corner a few seconds later. And all of a sudden we can see the impact from the bullets on the surface of the shield. So that is most definitely a, a continuity error. Yeah, and the last one we've got is, this is going back to the, the car in the shed and the, that scene afterwards. So there is a wheel that is shot off on Bond's car during the frozen lake chase. And a few seconds later on, Bond is jumping, you know, Bond is in the car, he's jumping over some of the Russian Czech soldiers and the um the 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 wheel is is on again so that's a definitely a continuity error the rain room. let's get into it I, i'm gonna steal your thunder i'm gonna talk about the gun barrel i know you you love to talk about the various shades of of beige and <laughs> mauve and all, all the other colors of the rainbow that we've had there's no there's no color talk here though so but for obvious reasons, they need a new gun barrel sequence because we've got a new actor. Um, they use the same one for both films. Dalton walks very quickly, turns and fires, and only crouches slightly and shoots with one hand. So the different stance to what we've seen from Moore, who kind of steadies himself with his other arm, if memory serves correctly. And um, quite a sad note here, this is the last gun barrel sequence designed by Maurice Binder, who sadly died in 1991. He created the opening title credits for all the Bond movies so far, with the exception of From Russia with Love and Goldfinger. Just to finish off the gun and gun barrel sequence, Andy, because you you know you stole my thunder here, as you stated. Binder apparently stated that he came up with the idea of the gun barrel sequence in 20 minutes, because he had a meeting with the producers of the Bond franchise, and he had to come up with an idea, and he, he apparently had had this idea within 20 minutes, and then walked into. The meeting with the producers and told them about it and they love the idea and obviously now it's just it's iconic a 20 minute idea turns into a, a 60 year plus moment can you honestly imagine a bond film without it now no and i'm sure there's films out there that have kind of copied it sometimes like spoof spy films and i can't think of anything from memory but i'm sure i've seen where someone's done copied it you know in terms of the style but yeah that's that's pretty amazing, really. And like you said, you know, this is the the last one. And, you know, obviously last week we said goodbye to Lois Maxwell for Miss Moneypenny. And now we're saying goodbye to Maurice Binder. So no one lasts forever, do they, in the old Bond franchise? You only live once, I guess. Poor taste. We I'll edit that out. Poor taste. <laughs> we still got Q. You, you know. Anyway, carrying on, we're, we're starting now. So we've had the gun barrel sequence. No boff, Andy. You missed out the boff. I needed the uh, the Dulux colour chart in front of me to list them off. But <laughs> yeah, I missed that one. We didn't have any um, Savannah Sunrise or anything like that, did we? No. So it kicks off in Gibraltar and the film opens up with a military exercise involving the double O agents and the SAS on the Rock of Gibraltar. Yeah, I'm, I made a quick note at this point because I was kind of surprised or taken aback by 
the scene on the beach where there was barbed wire and barricades everywhere. And it, and it reminded me more of like a World War One or World War Two scene. You know, this is mid to late eighties. Um, it just it just took me by surprise that that's what Gibraltar would have looked like at that time. But maybe that's my ignorance of the the history of Gibraltar. Yeah, I I don't know anything about Gibraltar, if I'm being honest, Andy. So this is where we see M now. So M has a small area in the back of the plane where it kind of it acts as an office. So he's got his desk in there, and this seemed a bit weird to me and the missus because we both we both commented on this at the same time. And as the plane doors open and the double air agents um, are preparing to jump out, they jump out. And then you see some papers are being blown blown or disturbed on M's desk. And we both said, why would you have that? Because there's such a risk of some confidential papers just blowing out of the, the doors. It just seemed silly to have that in there. And it didn't make any logistical sense. I agree. But, you know, why isn't it a separate room on the plane? Or, you know, why have you got your papers just stacked on a on a desk in the middle of a, a plane? And, yeah. Doesn't make sense. Um, let's let's move on slightly. So uh, we see that um, one of the agents is, is climbing up a rope and there's an assassin at the top of like a cliff edge. Um, and he slides down the rope, this message on a tag. Uh, and we later see in the movie, it says Schmiet Spionam. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. And another note at this point, the, the soundtrack is noticeably different feels a little bit more electronic. I guess you could say a bit more 80s. Yeah, it was definitely noticeable. And straight away in the opening scene, we get that different type of music feel. But also, you know, straight away, we get our first speeded up camera sequence of the Dalton era. So we've had it a lot in the Connery films. We've had it the odd time in the Moore films. And straight, straight away, we get the this the, the fast forward camera bit and that's when bond is on top of the land rover when the assassin is driving yeah there's another staple of the bond franchise coming up in a second but i just wanted to make a note at this point so obviously this is supposed to be an exercise but at this point we have a real assassin on the loose and and bond is trying to hunt him down but one of the soldiers doesn't realize this and uh, i think he shoots bond um, with the, like the paintball gun, uh, but Bond is carrying on. He's still in the game, as far as he's going. And so, and it's just the way Bond. Um, he's on the Land Rover. The Land Rover goes past, and, and the officer goes, "Here, hang on, you're dead." Uh, it's just the, and it was, that was not a bad accent. I think you'll find as well. Um, just that made me chuckle the way it was just so casual, clearly oblivious to what's going on, um, but doesn't like the fact that that Bond is is cheating at the game and is is not dying like he's supposed to. Yeah, no, and it's funny because that, that accent, Andy, was it was spot on, mate. Um, and it always makes me laugh when you hear English people in films because this is obviously, you know, the majority of the cast, especially in MR6, are English, but that had a very thick Cockney accent, would you say? Yeah, I would say it's... It's almost like the default English accent of choice for an actor who has been told you need to do an English accent. So they, they go, you know, you st I guess the the line you would use to practice that would be call by me, governor. If you close your eyes, do you think that sounded like Dick Van Dyke? Close, yeah. You, you could imagine that, couldn't you? Uh, one final point before we move on. Um, I mentioned the staple of the franchise um, reappearing. The green screen. Very dodgy again at points during this chase. And, you know, at this point, we're 25 years into the franchise. And there's been no real improvement in that area of the movie making. Just a, an interesting point that I noted. This this scene is good, Andy. So I, I do agree with you in terms of this being your, your favourite scene. But like I said, for me, it was hard to pick one. But I think this was a highlight. But... Andy, I don't know if you've what your thoughts on this bit is because so the car the Land Rover goes over the, the barrier, bond the explosives are about to go off, 
and Bond uses his backup parachute to escape the car as it goes over the cliffs. Now, when that happened, the missus said, he's got another parachute. And I said, well, I mean, I, I'm not a, a, a secret agent or anything, Andy, or I'm not in the Marines or anything like that. So I don't know by default, do parachutists have backups all the time? So is that a standard that he has a backup? And he must have kept it, obviously he kept his parachute on, whereas the, the assassin, was he already on the island or did he come down? I can't remember. Uh, the assassin was already on the island. Yeah, so, okay. wouldn't have so had that's one. why he didn't have, yeah. But I think in yeah. terms of your backup question, I'm not a skydiver, no surprise to, uh, to, for me to tell you that. But I'm sure backup parachutes are pretty standard. Certainly these days, I'm not sure about you know, 30 odd years ago, but it didn't surprise me that they had a backup, I would say. Yeah, it, it, yeah, I didn't think, um, I wasn't kind of offended when that happened. I thought that was logical, but yeah, the missus did query that, but, um, I, I, I argued Bond's case there. But then again, she, she did mention, so we get then the camera then cuts to Linda, who is, who's, well, she, she's talking, but straight away, the wife says, oh, another one for Bond to sleep with. So straight away, she's, you know, giving Bond the daggers. And then Linda states, if only she can find a real man. She's, yeah, she says, oh, if only she can find a real man. And then Bond cuts landing on the yacht. So I quite like that. And again, the missus quick-witted here. And she says, this is another boat scene with Bond and a Bond girl. And I have to agree, she's not wrong there. Usually it's at the end of the movie, isn't it? Where you get Bond at sea with the Bond gal, uh, but straight away, we, Bond is there on a yacht with a Bond girl. Bond really does like a bit of sex on the boat, doesn't he? I guess the, yes. I guess the old saying is, it's all about the motion of the ocean. <laughs> yes. I don't know whether we should keep this in, but you could say he likes water sports. Uh, the the rating of the rating room has just gone from PG to 18 plus, I think, with that comment. <laughs> just cut that out. Yeah, the, kid, the... kids, ask your mum and dad what that means. <laughs> if you're listening to this in the car. If, you, if you're on your way to a family holiday and you're listening to this as, <laughs> uh, as to, while the time away, um, enjoy your trip. Uh, kids, ask lots of questions. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Uh, we're at the opening title sequence now. Uh, the last, this is the last Bond film to be scored by John Barry, um, who's been a staple of the franchise so far. Interesting point around the working relationship between John Barry and Aha. It was quite tumultuous, I would say. Um, it deteriorated as they were working together, and it actually resulted in two different versions of the theme song. We've got Barry's version, which is heard on the film soundtrack, Whereas the version that Aha preferred is on the, their album, Stay On These Roads. Aha claimed Barry didn't deserve a credit on this song. Barry compared Aha to the Hitler Youth. So, you know, that escalated pretty drastically, it has to be said. It did. And Andy, you know, this is an oversight on my part, so apologies. Usually, you know, when we start talking about different versions, I'm all over YouTube. But I've not listened to the Aha version on their album so i can't comment i think what i'll do is i will add that to the end of my bond spotify playlist if i can find it so we have the the alternate version as a as a bonus track if you will but then you would have to do that with all the other versions yeah i won't be doing that I'll just do it this one time <laughs> if you want me to do that for any others feel free to drop me a note on whatever social media platform and i'll tell you no thanks i'm not doing that uh, but final, final point from me for now is that this is one of the very few title songs not performed or written by a British or American artist. So we've got a bit more of a, an international flavour. Yes, we have. And departing from previous Bond films, the, the Living Daylights was also the first to use different songs over the opening and end credits. So we've had some... We've had some... What's the word? We've had some last and we've had some first, as you know, Andy mentioned about Maurice Binder. John Barry's also gone now. And now we've got our, our first. So 
the song heard over the end credits if, is If There Was a Man, which also acts as the kind of the love theme of the film, was also one of two films performed for the film by Chrissy Hyde of The Pretenders. And Andy, the other song, Where Has Everybody Gone? This is two songs I did YouTube. So I didn't YouTube the Aha one, but I did YouTube these two by um, The Pretenders, Chrissy Hind. And I, I wasn't liking them, if I'm honest. So the, the other song, like I mentioned, Where Has Everybody Gone, is heard on Nick Rose Walkman in the film. And this is the melody of the song that is used to kind of announce Nick Ross is there or whenever he's about to attack. So he, he's kind of got his own personal theme song going on. But also the pretenders were originally considered to perform the title song. But the producers... The, so the producers were pleased with the commercial success of Duran Duran with A View to a Kill. And obviously, if you listen to last week's episode, me and Andy put that in at number one on both our rankings and that's why they felt aha would be more likely to have kind of a similar impact on the charts because they they have a very similar vibe to duran duran but also andy i thought this was interesting and you can see the you can see the similarities between duran aha duran duran aha and also pet shop boys so pet shop boys were also asked to compose on a chart soundtrack but they, they did back out because they, they found out that they would only provide the opening theme song and they wanted to kind of have more input. So they they didn't um, take up the offer. But I think Pet Shop Boys would have been quite a, a good version as well. I like some of their songs. Yeah, that would have been a nice continuation from Duran Duran, I think. I'm going to go off script at this point, Jay, and I'm going to ask you a quiz question. <laughs> okay. So if you recall last week, we talked about a View to a Kill. It was nominated for a Grammy, I believe, if memory serves me correctly. And we talked about how it reached number one in the US charts, but only number two in the UK charts. We did, yeah. Do you know what kept it off the top of the UK charts? I don't, but I'm guessing something by Pet Shop Boys or Aha. Uh-huh. No, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And this this question has nothing to do with what we've just talked about. But after we recorded last week's episode, I was I, I took my, my dad shopping a couple of days later and we we're in the car listening to Radio 2. And, in, and on, uh, it's a Saturday afternoon, they do classic charts and they were doing the top 40 from a week in May 1985, I believe it was. And at number two was a view to a kill and and, I, and it immediately brought to mind because we just recorded the view to a kill episode so it was like perfect timing so i was very intrigued to understand well what song could have possibly kept that off the top of the charts it's got to be an absolute banger and it was the song 19 by paul hardcastle which is an utterly terrible song but that was enough to keep it off the chart and apparently that was a number one for five weeks in the uk so just anyone who bought that song, what were you thinking? And that is a song that I don't think I've ever heard of, or if I start to listen to it. That is a song I will YouTube now, Andy, late after we finish our podcast at midnight. I'm going to go on YouTube and listen to that just to see, just to get my view on it. But anyway, let's move on, because like you said, we've got a lot to get through and it's getting late. Um, one last thing on, on the music side. We've got a number of pieces of classical music um, the Bain Bond Girl, Cara Millivoy, is a cellist. And we've got pieces from Mozart, from Borodin, from Strauss and Tchaikovsky. And a final note from me on the opening credits was something that I noticed. There seemed to be a more concerted effort to hide, or sorry, to hide, to protect the girl's modesty. So we've seen in pretty much all the films now, uh, there's the, the naked models dancing or doing somersaults or whatever it is they're doing and it's clear that they are naked whereas this time round we've got girls in swimsuits we've got girls in body paint so there seems to be more of an effort to protect their modesty yeah maurice maybe um yeah changing his tone for the um opening credits before he packs his bags and and goes i don't know but i did i did notice that andy especially in terms of the the body makeup yes maybe it's a sign of the change in times so Bond is in Bratislava, 
It's helping Saunders from Section V uh, with the defection of General Georgi Koskov. Saunders gives Bond a bit of a telling off. Bond makes a comment about the cello player, uh, and he says something along the lines of, I forget the ladies for once, Bond. So it's just another example of people knowing all about Bond's reputation as a womanizer. I, I added a little note here that there was clearly a reason that he was calling out the cello player, and we'll we'll get to that as we go along. Uh, Bond tries to get a little bit more information out of Saunders, uh, but Saunders quotes some regulations and don't give Bond any more intel. I want to say he says something like section 27, paragraph 5, or something or other. Um, you know, gives gives Bond the um, I'm not telling you anything kind of line. Yeah, there's yeah, he's, he's not happy, is he? But also, something I picked up Andy, and I don't know this is my OCD kicking in. Koskoff he, he goes to the toilets and he goes into the toilet cubicle but he, he flash, flushes the toilet straight away to hide the noise that he's opening a window to make an escape. Now I so I made a note here to say why did he flush the toilet as soon as he came in because that just seemed odd but then like I said my my OCD kicking in there to think maybe the person before him didn't flush and he he didn't want to wee on someone else's way so he flushed it there so I don't know if you have any views there or am I just overthinking that particular bit it's a good observation and I think your your reasoning for why he might have done was was very much more polite than what I would have said. So we'll, we'll continue <laughs> to the next point. So Andy, I've got another question here. Bond notices a would-be sniper in a building opposite. So he's in a room with Saunders and he's preparing to help Koskoff escape and tech out anyone that's going to stop Koskoff defecting. But Bond notices that there's something a bit odd about this would-be sniper. So he shoots the rifle out of her hands. Now, I thought this was odd straight away, so I made a note because I don't know the anatomy of a gun, but he, he shoots kind of the bit that you, um, I would say like a handle on it. But the way she was holding the, the sniper rifle was kind of to her chest. Surely the bullet would ricochet. And I know if she gets injured, doesn't she? But surely that, it was so close to her, sh her chest, surely that would have, the danger there of the bullet then kind of ricocheting, ricocheting into a major organ was quite high. I don't know what your view was. It's a very risky shot. And you're right, I think she... Does she injure her right arm? In yeah, the... definitely an arm. I can't remember which one it was, but yeah. Yeah, very very risky. But, but maybe that's just how good Bond is, or at least how good he thinks he is. Yes, may, yeah, maybe. Maybe. I would, I would just try to think could have you know in that situation obviously we're not snipers would it have been less dangerous to kind of shoot say like a light bulb that might have been in the room or shoot the window so it distracts her but then you could argue the sniper could have still got the shot off bond takes cost off to the escape route now this is something that i remembered and i said at the top of the podcast but we also see a technician helping bond and this is one of the instances, Andy, where we see something on screen and, you know, it kind of triggers our memory. And I remember this bit where she kind of seduces the engineer and I remembered that there's like lights flashing or instruments or, you know, um, bleep, um, beeping or there was stuff happening in the background and obviously she's seducing this engineer, distracting. But the, the wife made a witty comment here to say, oh, that's not the usual Bond girl that Bond is um, used to. In, I would tend to agree as well. But it's, it's at this point, I also know there was a, quite a funny line about this being a pipeline to the West. And the escape route is an actual pipeline. So I thought that was a, a nice play on words, but an also quite unexpected considering the, the, the context there. So that was, that was a nice little line. It was, and... We actually discussed this, Andy, because when he mentioned that, the missus said something like, how is, he, how is he actually going to escape? And I said, well, Bond actually said it there. I said he, he meant it literally, not figuratively. So I agree, it was an, a nice play on words. Moving on slightly, I mentioned the technician here that helped Bond. Now, the technician looked really familiar 
And it turns out, you know, as part of the research that we've done, her name is Julie T. Wallace. But I originally thought she was Pam Ferris, who plays Trunchbull from Matilda. So, Andy, I don't know if you, when you were looking at the, the notes, did, did you see that or not? Or am I totally getting, am I facing, am I having a bit of face blindness there? I, I'm not going to go as far as to say that, but I knew it wasn't her, but I can, I could understand how you would think it would be very, very similar features. So a bit, yeah. So Pam Ferris also was in the Darling Buds of May, which is an English TV program. Marlarkins. I don't know if it ever got shown overseas, but Julie T. Wallace she also she's also obviously featured in a number of roles including the fifth element so i do remember remember in that she's a an army person as well i can't remember what character she played but she's also appeared in tv shows like lovejoy the detectives last of the summer wine and also hotel babylon so she's obviously got a few credits to her name but we see so we see koskoff enter the pipe and you know he ends up going um to his destination, destination which is in Vienna, and we see Q on lo- location again. So Q is getting about now a lot more, um, in so you know in the Bond franchise. So that's nice, and he welcomes Koskoff. So I've made a note here, Andy, to say Q must now be the longest running actor in the franchise now that Lois Maxwell has left. I think that's that is the case, isn't it? I I've, it's certainly the joint longest running because from memory was he not in Doctor No. So is Doctor No a film where we did see Money Penny but we didn't see Q. That's correct. So so at this point I think it is fourteen all. Ah uh, right, yeah, so joint, yes. I believe. Well we, yeah, we could sense check that because yes, I'm trying to think because then he gets named um Major Boothroyd, is it? as well in the next film and not necessarily Q but it is still him yes I think you're right there final point in Austria or or the border should I say noticeable tension still between Saunders and Bond and if memory serves me correctly just going back to an earlier point we made around uh, Saunders quoting some regulation I think this is the point where Bond uses uses his line against him um, about something being an, on a need to know basis because of such and such regulation so uh, yeah it does do yeah well played mr bond uh moving on let's go to mi6 and q branch next uh we see money penny and we've got a new actress um lois maxwell is no more welcome caroline bliss to the role uh, bliss plays money penny for both of the dalton films before being replaced by samantha bond in goldeneye and interestingly Caroline and Samantha are childhood friends. Yeah, that is interesting. And Andy, so I'm gonna I'm just gonna say this point, and then I want to see what you thought about this. So Bond and Money Penny are flirty with each other, and it's indicated that Bond, or indicated, implied that Bond slaps Money Penny on the bomb because you get this sound effect of a a slap, but you don't actually see it. So the missus said, "Oh, did he slap her on the ass there?" I said, yeah, I think he must have done because you got the slap. But what do you? So what did you think about that? But also, I thought the flirting was a bit over the top. Awkward is the word I would use for the flirting. Just didn't didn't feel natural. Didn't feel like like Connery and Maxwell, or even more and Maxwell. Just felt a little bit. I think over the top is probably a good a good way of putting it. It was it was overacted, maybe is a better way of putting it and it didn't it didn't actually feel all that flirty even though i think it was supposed to be maybe it was just that it just didn't feel natural but yeah it it was off to me and what about the the bomb slap do you think that took place i i, I agree i think that's what happened i think that's what it was and i think it was out of place not necessarily out of character but certainly out of place in that setting Yes, don't do that at work any... Well, I would say you can't do that at work anymore, but obviously we wouldn't do that at work anyway, Andy, will we? You speak for yourself. You don't know where I work. <laughs> so, moving on, Q 
Q introduces Bond to the Ghetto Blaster, uh, which I thought was a nice little play on words. And also the the sofa couch for our American listeners that kind of eats the the victim that sits on it is the note I've made there. So we now transition to this safe house. And this is where we're introduced to Nick Ross, who who kills the, the regular milkman. You see him on his milk cart or floats. Nikos is played by Andres with nice ski. Apologies for anyone listening to that where I've just butchered his surname. So he's, he's actually played a number of roles, uh, including films like Die Hard. So he plays Tony, and this is the bloke who is killed, and he's dressed as with the Santa hat by John McClane and Bruce Willis, and he's a younger brother of Kyle. So I I did Google this, Andy, because I thought he looked familiar. And then when I saw, oh, yeah, it's Die Hard, and it's there, and he's walking around in a um, a grey shirt or T-shirt. And do you know which one I mean with the, the Santa hat? And he puts, I like, I think, ho, ho, ho on it. Yeah, so he's in that, and also he was in Mission Impossible. I, as soon as I saw the note that he wrote, it immediately came to mind because I, I was of a similar mindset that I, it was definitely familiar. And uh, whilst you were explaining that to <laughs> listeners, I, I googled the pronunciation and apparently it's Wisniewski. Wisniewski. There we go. Wisniewski. Close. Thank you, Andy. I'm not going to say it again. Every time we mention Negros, I want you to say his full name, <laughs> Andreas Wisniewski. Um, but anyway, let's move on. So uh, at this point, Bond demonstrates his expensive taste. Um, he's replaced an item on the shopping list with a more expensive bottle of champagne. I have, what, one main question here. And the question is, did they really send James Bond, 007, world-renowned secret agent, on an errand to do the shopping? Is is that really what they did? Because that just seems like a huge waste of his talents. I, I, Andy, I didn't really think of that until I saw your note and it made me chuckle because, yeah. That is not the best utilisation of MI6 resources, is it, at all? And would you trust Bond to go shopping? I wouldn't trust Bond with anything, really. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of the nature of Bond. But I wrote another question down, very sexist of me, but why couldn't Moneypenny go? Yeah, I, I agree. Why? Yeah, or even, you know, did it even need to be Moneypenny? They could have got the... The YTS, the work experience person, anyone just to go to Harrods to pick up um, the the shopping list. Yeah, so that did that did make me chuckle when I saw your note there because, yeah, it does seem a, a waste of bond time and resource of MI6. Smallbone, she would have been perfect for this job. Yeah, oh yes, Penelope. There you go. But anyway, uh, General Koskoff informs MI6 that the KGB is being run by the power-hungry General Pushkin. According to Koskov, Pushkin has revived the old policy of Shmerch Bayanam. Shm- I'll say that again. Uh, he's revived the old policy of Smerch Bayanam, which is literally Death to Spies, or Shmerch, uh, which is a program of Western spy assassinations. And while all this is going on, there there's a guy who... Uh, and I meant to look this up in terms of what the official title is, but there's a guy basically typing everything that's being said, um, like you would see in a courtroom. Is it a, is it a stenographer? Have I made that up? Sounds sounds good, doesn't it? It it does. I'm going to keep it in. And then if I'm wrong, I'll get abuse on Twitter. But I'm going to say it was a stenographer. But his typing was so slow. Like, there's no way the speed of typing would have kept up with the conversation. Maybe he was typing up Bond's little post-it note from last week, you know, those three items that he just wanted <laughs> to write on there. So Nick Cross escapes with Koskoff. So, we, you know, we, we see um, some various bits here, but, in, you know, in the end, Nick Cross escapes with Koskoff. And after the scene we have with the exploding milk bottles, there's a fight scene with Nick Cross and Green 4, who is played by stuntman Bill Weston. And Weston has performed stunts in a range of movies, including Star Wars, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Saving Private Ryan, and Batman Begins. 
I thought that was a very good fight scene, Andy. It was a good scene, yeah. I would say close to my favourite, thinking about it. That could have easily slotted in in that favourite scene section earlier on. Very, very good. I do have a question about it, though. Where did the exploding milk bottles come from? So so when Necros attacks and kills the, the regular milkman, he's just out for a jog, or that's his cover. He's not carrying around exploding milk bottles on his jog. So does that mean they were already on the milk float? And if they were, then why does a normal milkman have exploding milk bottles on his milk float? I totally agree with you, Andy. It's not something I picked up. I I haven't a clue. Maybe the only thing I can think of is, did Nick Ross hide the milk bottles somewhere and then he jogged past the, the milkman before strangling him over the little wall, you know, with his walkman um cable and you just see it off screen because that's the only thing that i can think of explaining it because like you said he, he didn't have it with him at all you're not going to go jogging with some milk bottles are you so yeah that was a, a good pick and and that could have easily gone in the goofs or continuity section indeed and can i just say exploding milk bottles sounds ridiculous but it, i thought it actually works and I, I quite like it as a as a gadget or weapon in this film it was very clever yeah, and as you mentioned at the top of the podcast, Andy, James Bond only had one gadget. And you could argue Nick Ross's one was better, the exploding milk bottles. Moving on, we are back in MI6Q branch and we have we are a laughing stock of the intelligence agency. So things haven't gone down well because Koskoff has been taken from the safe house. Everyone is under the assumption that the KGB has rescued Koskoff from the British intelligence agency and they're not happy. M's not happy. So Bond is given a mission to basically go and assassinate the KGB general Pushkin. But Bond is very reluctant to carry out this order. But M, and I can't remember who he says, but M threatens basically to send someone else to kill Pushkin. But Bond then agrees to obviously undertake this assassination but he's kind of just buying some time really as we find out you know over the next few scenes yeah it's almost like he didn't want anyone else getting the credit for it um we see bond at key branch he's reviewing some of the latest gadgets and uh, it's quite a funny bit where uh, bond gets the key ring and he he sticks it to q's face mask and there's you have to whistle a tune to kind of set it off and he's about to whistle the tune really sort of giving Q a little bit of a scare in a playful way. A nice nice little interplay there between the two. And Bond gets some intel from Moneypenny and goes rogue and takes the Aston Martin with him. We then move back to Czechoslovakia. Uh, Kara Milovoy is taken by the KGB. Um, and then later on she returns to her apartment and Bond arrives and finds the blank bullets. And is this this is when he's starting to piece together what's happening. A uh, little bit of a note on on the actress who plays Kara, played by uh, Mariam Dabo, English actress. She would later feature in Playboy, and also she worked with John Glenn on the TV series Space Precinct in a guest starring role. So Mariam also co-wrote the Bond Girls Are Forever book with John Cork. Mariam auditioned for the role of Eva Nova in A View to a Kill, and Barbara Broccoli later included Mariam in the auditions for Kara. So she didn't quite get the part there. But I think that worked out well, Andy, because I know we've had one actress, Maud Adams from memory, come back to play two different Bond girls. But Mary Ann definitely got the bigger part by featuring as Kara in The Living Daylights compared to A View to a Kill role. So I think things worked out well there for her. All's well that ends well, that's for sure. Definitely. And Kara manages to lose a KGB agent who's watching her apartment. And this is, again, something, Andy, you know, where the scene starts. And I remember this. So when Bond leaves the apartment and he walks to his car, the KGB clocks him and just watches. And then Kara comes out um, like seconds later and goes into the phone booth with a cello case. And then a tram goes past and you see, you know, a figure 
is still in the um, the phone booth. And I remember that little disguise, a little manoeuvre. So I thought that was quite good. Yeah, very nicely played. I didn't didn't remember that scene and I didn't see it coming, but it was uh, very nicely done. Um, we see that Bond and Kara are being chased by the police later on, and this is where the Aston Martin really comes into its own. We We have the lasers from the Aston Martin cut away the top section of the police car. We have another car chase involving a blockade. Bond destroys that with the car rockets. And Bond then also manages to drive it on the ice and cuts a ring a ring on the ice around the police car using the wheel that has no tyre on it, which cuts the ice and the car sinks. And then um, the car also has boosters to fly over a ramp. So there's a lot of action with this Aston Martin. Very, very versatile. Packed full of gadgets and toys. Gets him out of a whole load of scrapes in this particular section of the film. He's definitely utilised all the the Q features, hasn't he, there, Andy? Definitely got his bang for his buck um, in that bit. There's two things I, I picked out here, Andy. One of them I didn't write down, and the other one I did. So the one I didn't write down... You know on the ice where Bond is driving with the, the wheel that's cutting the ice, don't you think the circle around the police car is quite small? It is. Now I think back. And I, when that happened, I thought, oh, I don't recall Bond going like that smaller circle. He was doing big loops, and then you see like the smaller circle, which is, uh, I would say, a few feet bigger than what the police car was. So I picked that up. Um, and then the other note I made was the Russian skiers are wearing appropriate snow camo in this scene, whereas last week, obviously, they were wearing green when they were chasing Roger Moore through the slopes. Just goes to show every day's a school day. You're not too old, not too old to learn something new. Um, we we see Bond and Cara escape down the hill using the cello case as almost like a, a snowboard of sorts. Um, no cheesy music, no California girls playing this time round, but it's uh, it's quite a fun scene, I would say. Um, and as they they're going down the hill, they get to border control, and I think Bond passes Kara his passport, and she just he says hold that, and then as they slide past, they just say they've got nothing to declare, and they go straight through the border. It's quite a, a funny, funny scene, I would say. This is where. And there's a couple of other points in the film as well, but this is where I noticed Dalton's accent. Um, he is all the way through playing, you know, a quintessential Englishman, but he's a Welsh actor. And I noticed the Welsh twang in his voice at this point and in a couple of other uh, points as well. And it just kind of took me out of the moment a little bit, that, um, that change in voice. Um, so he probably gets Doctor Point or two for that as well in my rating. Yeah, that that's a good pick up, Andy. I didn't pick that up. The bit I picked up was I I agree it was funny in terms of the passports, but I think this is a another in another incident of where the the tone just didn't quite fit. It was a comedy comedy um, scene. So it it felt more like a, a Roger Moore bit that did compared to the gritty version of Dalton. Yeah, completely agree. So we now leave the, the snowy mountains of Czechoslovakia and Austria. Was he going in Austria? Is that right? Was that the border on Austria? Yep, Austrian yeah. border. Thank you, Andy. Um, so in Changir, Vienna, and then we go back to Changir in this next... Um, these next few scenes. So we introduce to Brad Whitaker, who it turns out is an arms dealer. And Whitaker is played by Joel Don Baker, who is one of four actors to appear as both a Bond ally and also a, a Bond villain. So Joe so we're gonna go in the future. So apologies for jumping in the future here. So Joe Don Baker appears in two future Bond films, Goldeneye and Tomorrow Never Dies. And the other Bond actors that we've had so far is Charles Gray that played Henderson in You Only Live Twice and Blofeld in Diamonds Are Forever. Walter Gotill, who played 
Morzini, I don't know if that's right, Morzini in From Russia With Love and General Gogol in six films and Richard Keel who plays Jaws obviously in The Spy Who Loved Me and Moonraker. So Andy, I can't remember and apologies because as I say most weeks my memory is going. Did we pick up that General Gogol appeared in From Russia With Love as a different actor? I don't think we did. Do you remember which one that is? He's the one, do you remember where um, oh, Rosa Klebb goes to the, the tra- training complex of Spectra to meet Red Grant and she meets this bloke who is Walter Gotel, Gotel and she does the punch on Red Grant, you know, with the knuckle bosses. That's, that's him. Yeah, I can't remember if we mentioned that in that episode. Um, so listeners we've recorded quite a few episodes before we release them just to kind of get ahead of things and it's been weeks Andy hasn't it since we've done that one it so is. I can't it's remember been, I so. mean what we're on now episode 15 so it's been you know at least three months yeah. I'm, I'm just while while we're discussing this I'm just googling the the Mulsaney character and this there's not an obvious... I mean, it's clearly the same person. Now I can see some side-by-sides. But I don't think it's it's obvious that it's the same person unless you have that side-by-side image. It's not It's not a... I don't know. So it's hard to explain. It just it feels like he's changed a lot in between films. Yeah. So we can be um, forgiven for missing that then, Andy. Yeah. Or, you know, it could just be the, the medical face blindness... <laughs> in in full effect there um i just wanted to add a, a little point about this this scene where we're introduced to Boitica. um he's in what looks like a rubbish version of madden two swords there's loads of i guess loads of like dictators from the past in waxwork form lined up in a hallway but they're all terrible and then he's he kind of stands amongst them doesn't he as if he's one of the dummies or one of the waxworks and then just steps forward and introduce himself. It's a very, very bizarre introduction. It is. And while you were saying that, it kind of reminded me of the man with the golden gun. You know, with Knickknack and the sumo wrestlers where Bond is walking through the um, the gardens and they're like staying still with statues. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that's a good comparison. So Joe Don Baker has appeared in numerous films and TV shows, including Walking to... Cape Fear, Congo, and Lancer. But also, Andy, I think this is, this is you know, quite big news. And, you know, I picked this out last week in terms of the leather jacket. Bond is seen wearing a leather jacket, a soft leather jacket this time. So this is back-to-back Bond films where he's rocking a leather jacket. So just a comment there, a throwaway comment, but I thought I just wanted to kind of pick that one out. And Bond and Cara are enjoying a nice horse cart ride and sightseeing which is obviously i thought that was nice and enjoyable obviously andy's better half disagreed there with the cheesy smile but like i mentioned earlier this did remind remind me of tracy and bond in on a majesty's secret service that bond is kind of wooing and putting in the i don't want to say legwork but he's putting in the foundations isn't he in terms of well i want to say is it genuine is he just manipulating her just to kind of get that information regarding Koskoff? I think the kids these days would call it grafting. That's what he's doing, isn't he? He's, he's grafting. We we get to the hotel reception at this point, <laughs> and the hotel clerk asks, asks Bond if he wants his usual room, but Bond asks for something with a second bedroom, which I found a little bit odd, very unlike Bond. You know, is this way of him just trying to be respectful? Or does he just not fancy his chances at this point? I think it's probably the the former, where I think he's just doing what you said, the grafting, and he doesn't want to kind of push it too far because he's supposed to be Koskoff's friend, isn't he, at this point? So I think if he is basically wanting to just rock a, a king bed straight away, I think that's kind of going to blow his cover. We see Koskov, he's enjoying himself, he's at Whitaker's place, he's surrounded by beautiful women, getting himself a nice leg massage. Uh, and then we see Saunders and Bond meeting at the concert. Still that tension between the pair of them. So it's a bit of a, uh, an odd 
relationship that the two of them have. Uh, and then we get to the funfair, and Bond is enjoying a roller coaster. He's on the big wheel, and it's on the big wheel where he seduces Kara. So, Andy, I've got a question. Is this the first time Bond has been on a roller coaster? Because that just seemed a bit weird. And also, the other point is, you know, you, you mentioned the, the two bedrooms, but then Bond in, the, you know, the scene next scene pretty much, he's paid off the operator of the big wheel to stop the big wheel at the top to seduce us. So then my theory of saying he's pretending to be Costco's best friend or friend or acquaintance, so therefore he's not pushing it. Moments later, he's bribing the operator to stop the big will to seduce her, so he doesn't quite fit. Yeah, and it's at this point for me where I was just starting to get a little bit annoyed. The The dynamic between the two, between Bond and Kara, was very, very weird. So, you, so obviously, like you said, he's asked for the second bedroom, but then straight away he's seduced to the first chance he gets. But then also she's got this boyfriend, Koskov, but then she's also smitten by him. And it just seems... A very confusing dynamic between the two of them and it doesn't really work for me and I think it going back to the slightly earlier point around the, the horse and cart ride that cheesy smile that my wife referred to was another kind of off-putting thing because it just felt like it, it felt a little bit fake and and also you know let's let's go a little bit deeper into Dalton's performance he's He's got his edgy moments where he's quite violent and sadistic. And now he's got this softer side where he seems to be falling in love. And there's the fake smiles and there's the respectful side, but then he's also juicy. And it's like, what is he trying to be? What is what is Bond at this point? Because it, it seems to be all over the place. And I think that's another thing where it just kind of let his performance let down this film it was at this point in the film that it really kind of hammered home to me that i'm not enjoying the dalton performance this was this was kind of the the straw that broke the camel's back for me yeah i agree in terms of the the build up the the ruin this is where i said at the beginning it there are certain bits where it just didn't really feel right and i totally agree with what you said there andy yeah, absolutely. Inconsistent is is the, the buzzword for me. I, yes, I agree. So Bond and Saunders now meet in a cafe. And this is obviously the, the plot hole that Andy mentioned earlier on in the pod. And But Saunders and Bond, they, they do leave on good terms. So Saunders has obviously got the information for Bond and he's also got um, some documents for Bond. So they leave on good terms. But as Saunders is leaving, he gets squished by the glass door that Nikros has sabotaged. So Bond comes darting over and then he sees these balloons that he saw Nikros. When Bond was on the big wheel, he saw someone kind of observing Saunders and he had some balloons. So he noticed the balloons here um, over the the bushes. Um, and he gives chase, but it's actually... Um, it's someone else it's not dick Rose at all and this is this has gone to the extreme now it's very dark dalton is so you've got your darker bits at the beginning of the film but now saunders is being killed he's, he's just full-on dark and this is very much down to um very similar to the daniel craig films now that kind of version of bond yeah i agree and i think where craig got got his interpretation or you know um What's the word? His influence was probably these kind of scenes. And I think if, if Dalton had played this all the way through in this manner, it's a very different film and probably scores a lot higher. We have some boob action. And, you know, the child in me loves looking out for this kind of stuff. Very obvious as well. Uh, Bond uses Pushkin's date, uh, Rubovich, to distract a KGB bodyguard. Um, rips the top off when the guard comes in the door. I would, one thing I would say, there's no real attempt to hide it. And if memory serves correctly, this film is rated PG. Um, so a little bit strange that it would, it would be so blatant. Because we, you know, we've seen stuff in the past. 
and it seems to be more accidental, this seems, you know, is blatant. So that's uh, quite an interesting um, shifting in gears. Uh, Rubovich, played by Virginia Hay. She's appeared in several films and TV shows. Mad Max 2, Farscape, Neighbours and Home and Away, just to name a few. And then we see that Negros is about to assassinate Pushkin, but Bond beats him to it, or so it seems. Yeah, and this is... So the comment I made here, Andy, was... And I don't know what your view is, because we kind of discussed this before in Moonraker, where the would-be assassin was hiding in a tree with a rifle to shoot Bond. And this kind of brought back memories here. So we see Nikros is using a pistol and he's kind of like aiming in, like holding a pistol. I can't remember if he's squinting or closing one eye. And I was thinking like, he's from the a balcony and there's a bit of distance. Why is he using a pistol? It just didn't seem like the right tool to use. Surely a rifle would be more appropriate. But then I thought, maybe a rifle would be harder to get in because of security or someone would have had to hide a rifle somewhere earlier in the day to get it in so maybe a pistol was easier to get in that was my ramblings in terms of that scene but i liked it because then nikros turns the um the big light i can't think what you call him to to bond and bond is like you know everyone sees that bond's the assassin yeah so that's a nice scene and i, I guess you know, he's already hidden traps in in the cafe door and he's hidden exploding milk bottles early, so hiding rifles as well is, is probably a step too far. I, I made a note here, so obviously you know, Pushkin is not assassinated, as we, we find out later on. It's been it's been faked. Um and the note I made here is that the fake blood in this particular scene is more realistic than the real blood that we've seen in previous films, i.e. the blood that, that is supposed to be clearly fake is more realistic than the blood, is that, than the blood that is supposed to be real. <laughs> does that make any sense? It does make sense, yes. Yeah. Um, but yeah, obviously, yeah, we knew that Pushkin, it was a fake assassination, but I, I still like it. I thought that was a nice little um, fake assassination, fake blood, etc., but Bond is escaping and he gets outside and he's taken away by two women. And it turns out they they work for Felix Leiter. So, Andy, I, I, I like this because Felix has returned now after a six film absence. And we've got a new actor. So we've now had Felix appearing in six Bond films and he's played by six different actors. And we obviously covered this in an earlier podcast where we, we talked about the, the producers changing... The, the Felix actor so often. But yeah, I thought that was um, nice that he's returned. So like the Aston Martin return, and Felix Leiter returns. Like Old Faithful is back. Interesting as well. At this point, we've had more Felix Leiter actors than Bond actors. Yeah, we have. Um, and may that continue. Well, it will do, won't it? So... Koskoff takes a phone call and he looks worried so the camera kind of um, zooms in and we later find out that the phone call was from Kara. Yeah, we see uh, Bond goes back to the room where Kara is waiting for him and Bond is poisoned by, I think it's by a martini, isn't it? Or supposedly a martini, so that she's prepared for him. Yeah, I think it is a martini. But when, as soon as that scene was happening, the missus said, oh, I bet that's poison. And I thought, oh, yeah, it may be. I couldn't recall that. And then obviously it turns out it is poison. And then Bond is trying to say something, isn't he? But then obviously he passes out. Yeah, he's, he's starting to like slur his words and then passes out. Uh, he's then taken uh, by ambulance to an airfield and the guards check his passport at this point. And the passport reads Jutsi Bondov, which um, you, you've noted is a very lazy alias, and I I completely agree with with that. It's um, it's it's quite cute in a way that that it is, but it is it is lazy. It's not very original, is it? It's almost as bad as when Roger Moore is is James Singed Smythe or James Stock. 
It is. But the missus picked that one up, Andy, and I said, really? So we wound it back, and, it, you know, when it zooms in on the, the Finney Bob, um, the passport, it read that. And, yeah, we just thought, oh, that, that's quite funny, that is. Like you said, it's, it is quite cute. One One final point around this particular section of the film. Bond now has a clear knowledge of animal anatomy. Uh, there's a there's a heart being transported, and he tells Kara that it is an animal's heart rather than a human heart. So add animal anatomy to the list of subjects that Bond is an expert in. If Bond ever went for his, um, another job, his CV would just be massive, wouldn't it? You know when he told us when we were younger to limit your CV to two pages... You couldn't imagine Bond doing that, could you? With all his other like Oriental languages, his depth of knowledge on different types of alcohol, butterflies, moths, etc. Skills and interest will be the main section <laughs> of his CV, that's for sure. We we now get to Afghanistan for the the first time actually in this movie so far. So we get to Afghanistan and Bond arrives in Afghanistan, and we've had this before, Andy, where. A scene happens, and then it's darkness. So Bond is taken to the prison. So this is happening, like, within minutes of each other. So Bond is landing in Afghanistan. Bond and Kara is taken to the prison cells. But before Bond is put in the cell, he manages to fight the guards and escape. And then when he escapes, it's darkness. So that's all happened within minutes. It's not like they've gone somewhere else or he's been in the cell for a bit so some time might have passed by and he escapes he's not even got into the cell and he escapes and then they come out and it's dark yeah must maybe the sun sets very quickly in afghanistan or maybe you spend you spent hours in central booking or something beforehand but yeah it's uh, a blatant um, continuity error maybe that's where we should have discussed it earlier but Certainly a, an error of sorts. I did have a question around this point, though, and I don't know if this is something that I missed in the detail, but there is seemingly a random prisoner in the vicinity, and Bond passes him the keys so that he, he can escape. And it just surprised me that Bond would show that s sort of compassion to a stranger, or someone who is seemingly a stranger, but as we find out, it's lucky that he did it. It just it didn't at the time it happened. It felt a little bit out of place. Okay, but we'll we'll hold that thought, shall we? I, when I saw your comment here, I thought about that and I thought, well, would it, what's that saying? The enemy of my enemy is my friend or something. Well, I don't know if it applies, but I'm basically thinking, if he's in prison for a reason then he'd probably do more damage if he's out, or even if he's a distraction. Like, he might run one way, and if you go the other way, even if he dies, you know, he's distracting the guards. That was my logic. Yeah, I can buy that. I can buy that. Knowing my luck, if we was caught in prison and we released someone, there'd probably be a serial killer, Andy, and kill us. Yeah, someone who takes a real pleasure in killing podcast superstars. Bond discovers that Whitaker and Koskoff are paying diamonds for a large shipment of opium um, which would turn a profit within days if it's distributed in the US um, so they continue supplying the Soviet with arms um, later we see Bond and Kara escaped and they're helped by the local Mujahideen and Bond makes some quip to Kara about how they they will save you for the harem so the locals help Bond and Kara infiltrate the airbase and Bond plants a bomb in the back of the cargo airplane, which is transporting the drugs. But Koskoff recognises him, so Bond is just about to leave the aircraft and he comes face to face. So Bond ends up hijacking the airplane while the the locals are attacking the airbase. We also see, so my wife liked this bit, so we see some bare bombs then of some men. So I think that's a bit of a first for the Bond franchise so far. And the wife commented to say... It's about time that the franchise so showed some male nudity for a change. I think it's quite disgusting that men are used in such a way. <laughs> you know, their sexuality and uh, is just being objectified. They're, they're being objective. That's the word. Yeah, they're objectified. It's uh, it's not on. It's, 
that's that's what I live with, Andy. That's what I have to tolerate. I'm always being objectified, <laughs> if only. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're also another bit there. So this is where you know uh, the wife has had lots of comments in this film. So you, you can tell she was really engaged and enjoying it. She wasn't asleep or on a phone. So she did comment on this one where Koskoff is driving a car, and it crashes into the plane, but then. Initially, it blows up, doesn't it? There's quite a lot of flames. And you think, oh, that's the end of Koskov. But then he, he survives. And then he's like, she said, how did he survive that? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why. It's a, it's a valid question to which I have no answer. Let's let's continue. We're, we're getting close to the, to the end now. Um, Millivoy at the last minute joins Bond in the airplane takeoff. And she assumes the controls while Bond leaves to defuse the bomb. We find out that Nikros is stowed away on board and he attacks Bond. And uh, Millivoy accidentally opens the cargo door. Bond and Nikros are sucked out and the, the cargo net that's kind of holding the opium in place, they're fighting on that. Um, and this is where Nikros drops to his death. So he's, he's left hanging from Bond's boot. And I think it's pretty cool that the way that Bond just cuts his bootlaces and Nikros drops to his death. It's... Uh, it's quite a nice scene, and he, he finds the bomb, uh, defuses it with two seconds left on the fuse that's amongst a, a slew of bags. But I think this whole sequence is quite quite good. I think it's quite a nice high action, high octane portion of the film. I think this it, it's at this point it starts to pick back up up again. And this was this whole bit, you know, with the the plane and the the attack on the base was my favourite scene, and I agree. I think. That whole bit was um, was definitely the highlight for me. Yeah, I, in my original notes, just to give you some inside baseball, I just stopped writing because I, you know, I was starting to get really bored. Like the film started off on a high, went down, went down, and then it was just getting hard to watch. But then for this for this scene, it did perk up. So I have to give give credit; they did end on a high at least. Um, and we move to the final part of the film. Uh, between Tangier and London. Bond infiltrates Whitaker's residence with a bit of help from Leiter. Uh, and he pops in as, as General Whitaker is playing a battle in his terms. And when Bond tells him, the opium is burned. Yeah, so Whitaker is an appy. And this is where, you know, you pick this out, Andy, as a continuity error, where Whitaker's using the gun with a shield on it. But... Bond manages to dispatch of Whitaker and, and he dies. Andy, the, the, the thought I had on that was, though, the shield on a gun seems quite practical, but you don't really see it. So there must be reasons why they don't have it, because I suppose carrying it around isn't great. But it does kind of make sense to protect you from headshots and upper chest shots. Yeah, there's, it's a smart bit of kit, but, but may, maybe the, uh, the cons outweigh the pros. Yes, yeah, to try to carry it around and everything. So... The last comment for me, um, really, in this these last scenes is Kara performs and we see M, General Pushkin, and General Gogol is in attendance. Yeah, Gogol is now a diplomat in the foreign ministry. And it's the last time that Gogol appears in the Bond franchise. Um, it was due to appear in more scenes, but Walter Gertel's health was, was somewhat deteriorating, so the scenes were reassigned to another character which is a, a little bit of a, a sad note to end on. And finally, John Barry, the composer of the music for many, many of the Bond films, has a cameo role conducting the orchestra in Vienna at the end of the film. So uh, nice for him to get his, his on-screen moment. Yeah, it's a nice little cameo. I'd love to do cameos, Andy. You know, if I wrote a film or directed a film, I'd be like a non-speaking part. I would love to do that. Just a little nod. So any kind of fans or anyone that liked my work, they can go, oh, there's, there's Jay in the background. I wouldn't want to be like full on giving lines. It'd just be one of those like walking on parts or plays a dead body or something like that. Would you maybe take some lines but have someone else dub your voice? Like um, like we saw in the early Connery films, particularly with the Bond girls where Nikki Van Zyl seems to do every Bond girl. Um, the, does her voice, I mean. Yeah, um, I, I think, uh, yeah, I'd do that as long as Morgan Freeman could do my voice. Morgan Freeman would, would suit you, yeah, yes. definitely. 
Yes, the voice of God. I, I'd go. I'd go with a with a Tom Hanks, very authoritarian, respectful. That's a, that's the film. The Rain Room. This is the sixty second review by James Bond superfan. This week's reviews are provided by Toby and Stuart. Toby, you have sixty seconds. Start the clock. We are introduced to Dalton's first outing as 007 in Gibraltar with one of the most memorable pre-credit action sequences. Bond is sent to assist in the defection of a Russian general and with early plot twists he finds himself befriending a female sniper who tried to prevent the defection. Unconvinced by what he discovers, 007 has to escape the Eastern Bloc with her, assisted by a beautiful gadget filled Aston Martin and a cello. Our Bond girl is not the strong character we saw in more films, but more timid. This means she has to be dragged through the film by Bond, sometimes literally. Action includes the aforementioned opening scene, one of the greatest car chases of any Bond, rooftop set piece set in Tunisia, and a grand battle set in a Russian airbase in Afghanistan. Our villains are less memorable, but Dalton eases into the role with panache. A shame he didn't do more films as he got the balance right, playing it grittier with a more serious and imposing approach than his predecessor. This is a film that will normally find its way into a Bond fan's top three. A solid 9 out of 10 for the film, and 9 out of 10 for Dalton's performance. Stuart, you have 60 seconds. Start the clock. Once more onto the breach, dear friends, it's time for Bond meets Shakespeare meets Victor Meldrew. I don't believe it, it's the start of the Dalton era. 007 is tasked with safely extracting a defector while someone who looks suspiciously like Gail Platt from Corrie tries to kill him. It's a whole new edgy world for Bond. From henchmen with exploding milk bottles, the dwarf from Lord of the Rings replacing the bald guy as head of Russian espionage, and even Money Penny's updated to be a younger woman who loves Bay Manilow. How contemporary for the 80s could you get? Sadly, Barry doesn't do a Bond version of the Copra, but we get a high energy song from Aha. So, hey driver, if you're looking to go to Eastern Europe, Europe, Harrods, Morocco, Afghanistan and back again and you like a man who's far more serious than Sir Roger but happy to ride on a horse in full Afghan gear chasing a plane then this is for you. It's got some good ideas but don't set your hopes up way too high. Two exploding milk bottles. A big thank you to Toby and Stuart for recording this week's 60 second review by James Bond superfan on the rating room. The rating room. Let's get into our usual segments that we we do each week so i'm going to kick off here so this is the the one-liners and quotes so oh andy i've got i've got a big one here so i didn't think this one through so this is bond and linda so this is at the top of the the film the beginning of the film the opening sequence where bond and linda interact so linda is talking on the phone and linda's saying it's also boring here Margot. there's nothing but playboys and tennis pros if only I could find a real man. This is where James Bond lands on the boat with a smouldering parachute. And he says, I need to use your phone. So he texts it and says into it, she'll call you back. And Linda goes, who are you? Bond, James Bond. And then he says, exercise control, 007 here. I would port in an hour. And Linda says, won't you join me? And Bond goes, better make that too. Another scene later on is between Bond and Koskoff. And this is where... Koskov is escaping via the pipeline. And Pond says, relax, Georgie. Our engineers have spent months perfecting this. Koskov replies, how many times have you done this before? Pond says, you're the first. And then he fires him down the pipeline into Austria. Yeah, that was a, a funny scene. This next one for me is Q and Bond. And Andy kind of touched on this earlier on, actually, with the, the key ring. So Q says, we packed the finder with a highly concentrated pl plastic explosive sufficient to remove a door of any safe. It's magnetic. The, the actuating signal is personalized. And then James Bond goes, what's my code? And Q goes, most appropriate, a wolf whistle. And um, finally, we get a bit of wordplay between Bond and Moneypenny. Bond says, Moneypenny, be a dear. Ask records to monitor check publications and news services. See if they can find any mention of a wo woman cellist at a conservatoire in Bratislava. Uh, Money Penny replies, I didn't know you were such a music lover, James. Any time you want to drop by and listen to my Barry Manilow collection. Yeah, that's another little funny one. So the, the next regular feature that we do is the book first movie. And I suppose the listeners that are really familiar with James Bond are aware of this already. So the living daylights is based on a collection of james bond short stories called octopussy and the living daylights and we we did touch on this andy didn't we in the octopussy episode 
as well about it being a short story. So in the book, the short story takes place in East Berlin, whereas obviously the movie takes place within the USSR, which has the, the sniper scene. And also in the movie, Bond defends defector Koslov. However, in the short story, Bond is actually defending a fellow agent called 272. Also in the story, Kara's character is called Trigger, and she serves as the main antagonist. And Trigger is also a much more skilled sniper than Kara. Uh, But also the pipeline escape route isn't featured in the short story. And if I was guessing, I would say that's probably a timing issue. Maybe, Maybe the pipeline only existed later on. I mean, obviously the film was from 87. The book would be, what, late 50s, early 60s, maybe? So a lot of time has passed. I don't know that. I'm just kind of guessing. I don't know. We could... Don't know. Either cut that or Google it quickly and then pull it in. <laughs> what do you want to do? Um, I'm not going to Google Russian pipelines, not this day and age. <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it. But, um, Jay, let's let's lighten the mood. Do you want to hear one of my famous James Bond jokes? I want to listen to your infamous James Bond jokes. So I tried shoplifting a James Bond DVD once. But the security guard scared the living daylights out of me. That's a good one. And that is um, topical. You've linked it in with the, the film that we watched this week. Are you ready? Let's start the quiz. Our regular listeners will know about this. So just to recap for any new listeners, this is where I pose Andy to... Well, four statements, two are correct and two are incorrect. So, from memory, last week, Andy, you got 50%. Correct me if I'm wrong. I believe you are right. So, you'll be looking to get maybe 100% this week. So, I pulled together four statements. So, are you ready? I am ready. Let's do this. Okay. The, The first statement is... Prince Charles visited the set of the Living Daylights and was allowed to press the button to set off the Ghetto Blaster rocket. The second statement. Maud Adams, who played Andrea Anders in The Man with the Golden Gun and Octopussy in Octopussy, was friends with the producers. She helped screen test actors to play Bond as she had experience of playing two Bond girls previously. The third statement. Timothy Dalton didn't perform any of his stunts in The Living Daylights due to a contractual commitment with the West End production of Antony and Cleopatra, where Dalton was due to play Mark Antony on stage after filming Wrapped for The Living Daylights. And the fourth and last statement. Christopher Reeve, famous for playing Superman, turned down a million dollar offer from Albert Broccoli to play Bond in this film. Would you like me to repeat any of these, Andy? I think I jotted them down correctly. This is another another interesting bunch. One one where I think any or all could be true. So you you've you've outdone yourself again. Are you really really setting the bar high? I stay up late pondering what questions to fire at you, Andy. I didn't do a Maurice Binder and just prep it and pull it together within twenty minutes of going live. I promise. That's that's good to know, and your hard work here has paid off. But I'm going to go with what I'm hoping gets me to the 100% mark, and I'm going to say that the the fact about Dalton not doing any stunts, I think is false. I think you've put that in as a bit of a red herring, because I know that Dalton is a classically trained actor, very known for his stage performances, so... Certainly believable that it would be asked to not do any stunts, but I don't believe it. I think he must have done at least a few. So I'm going to say that's, that statement is false. I'm also going to say that the Maud Adams statement is false as well. I can't see her being involved in Bond films without being on camera. So I'm going to say that Prince Charles did visit the set. I'm going to say that's true. And I'm going to say that Christopher Reeve was offered the part of Bond. 
Well done, Andy. You have got 100%. So Prince Charles did visit the set of Living Daylights and they actually used the the version where he pressed the button in the film. So he... I wonder if he got credited for that in the, the credits. I don't know. Maud Adams, she, you know, I did try to throw it there. You know, she had experience and she did appear in a third film, Uncredited, where she was in the airport from memory with her then partner. Um, and yes, I did try to throw it. So Timothy Dalton was playing Mark Antony in Antony and Cleopatra, but from memory, he either played that part before or after this film, but I can't remember. It wasn't directly afterwards. So interestingly, Andy, as well, you know your favourite scene at the beginning where the, the whole car chase and you know, Dalton on top of the car and everything. Apparently Dalton was actually, did his own stunt there on top of the Land Rover. Interesting, yeah. It was a, it was a good scene. I'm just looking up the um, Prince Charles visit to the set. And uh, there's an article on mi6hq.com where it talks about, in, on, in December 11th, 1986, Prince Charles and Princess Diana visited the set. Uh, but the main the main talking point they have here is that Princess Diana broke a bottle over Prince Charles' head. <laughs> so they had the kind of the the stunt bottles, you know, with the, with yeah. the sugar glass. And uh, there's a picture of her smashing a bottle over his head, which is... Uh, that's quite good. I like oh, that. I bet. I wonder how much she wished that was a real bottle. Imagine that. <laughs> Snuffing the future King of England if she, was, like, if she swapped it. And it was like a film accident, you know, with props as we've had in the last year with Alec Baldwin and stuff. Oh, could you imagine? Yeah. Or if she said after that didn't work, like, have you got any stunt bricks lying around that maybe I could have a go with? <laughs> or she, you know, in the future when she um, divorced Charles, she didn't walked up to audition for a Bond girl. We will never what, know, will we? What What would be a... A Bond girl name. It seems in dark, a bit of bad taste. This, but let's carry on anyway. Princess Diana as a Bond girl. What would be her her name? Is it, would there be some kind of like royal connection, or would you go like down a really smutty route? You know, like the pussy galore type name. I don't know. You could definitely put in princess. I think, but I don't know how you would, you would wordplay it. But you could definitely as a as a because we've had um. Prince Kamal Khan, haven't we? As I know, he's not a Bond girl, but a, as a villain, so you could do some kind of royalty villain Bond girl, couldn't you? Wordplay. Yeah, you could. I, I know it's not a name of a Bond girl, but she could be Diana the Day. <laughs> yeah. I'm here all week, folks. <laughs> So, well done, Andy. That's 100%. I must go back to the drawing board. I must do more prep on this quiz. So, I'm just marking it down, Andy, because I've got a little spreadsheet here where I'm logging your stats. So, at the end of the season, we can go through and we're going to do a little end of season episode, aren't we, Andy, where we kind of just, just talk about some bits um, before we move on to season two. Yeah, that's when you can present me with my trophy. For coming first place in the quiz maybe maybe it could be a golden trophy or it could it could be uh in the shape of an eye so it could be a golden eye or it could you know it could be a finger trophy you know a one finger because i'm number one a gold finger so some things to ponder there for you what i do uh, i will send james bond to harrods to pick it up for you mate you don't look impressed he's going to replace it with champagne isn't he <laughs> he, got, he got the shopping list wrong. Well, now, send, you, you wouldn't be getting champagne. Bone. It'd be more like white lightning or something. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a budget for champagne. Now, if, if any listeners out there want to send in cash so that Jay can spend it on a <laughs> glorious golden trophy for me, feel free to do so. Let's move on to our, our rankings. So, you know, this is... I, I like... It's hard, Andy, because I like talking about the film, but I also like looking at the rankings. You know, when we share our rankings before we kind of start recording this, I always look through, like I said before, some of them like your Bond girls, 
the rankings in terms of the movies, the villains. So I do like looking at where we place various films. So as usual, I'm going to kick off with one times kill count and martinis. So as I've stated earlier on in the podcast, James Bond had 13 kills in The Living Daylights and that puts him firmly in number six. So he is two under Octopussy and one above Andy's favourite Moonraker. So Timothy Dalton has been in one film and he's got a 13 kill, which obviously means 13 average. That's a strong entry um, for Timothy Dalton. It'd be interesting to see how many he does in A Licence to Kill because you could argue with the name of that film and thinking back, is he going to do more kills than 13 in his second Bond and last Bond film? As Andy mentioned at the top of the, the pod, two hours, ten minutes. So that is joint fourth with Thunderball. So as Andy's mentioned before, that is very consistent now. Each of the films are over two hour mark and On a Majesty's Secret Service still is out there at two hours, 22 minutes. Will that, will that ever be beaten? And lastly, before I pass over to Andy, is the martini watch and as andy mentioned yes bond does drink a martini and as he mentioned earlier it is explicitly mentioned shaken not stirred yeah thank you jay next up is the introduction of bond james bond and only seven minutes 24 seconds for this which is actually the third quickest of all the films where the introduction is made and i'm looking at the list of the quicker ones the there's one minute 30 for diamonds are forever which was the reintroduction of Sean Connery, and 4 minutes 25, which was the introduction of George Lazenby. And here we have, the third quickest, the introduction of Timothy Dalton. So I think that's quite a nice a nice little um, consistency there between, you know, when a new Bond comes in, with the exception of Roger Moore, it seems to be that they need to introduce themselves very, very quickly. Uh, and even going back to Dr. No, seven minutes 40 seconds so that's the fourth quickest which was the first time for sean connery so a new bond comes in bond james bond is said very early on seems to be the pattern we have no hat throwing and no hat wearing this time around and as mentioned earlier we do have a return of felix leiter so for the first time since live and let die actually so since roger moore's first outing we get the return of the, the Felix Leiter character, and as Jay mentioned, the sixth, the different actor, to play the role. Jay also touched on the box office stats earlier, so 191.2 million was the actual box office. Adjusted for inflation, that is now 487.8 million, which puts it second to bottom, just above A View to a Kill. But in terms of actual box office, it's pretty healthy, it has to be said. I believe... That's the third highest total behind For Your Eyes Only and Moonraker. So still a respectable effort and certainly um, very, very healthy in terms of the profit margin. Definitely. So moving on to Bond Girls. So this is, we've only had two Bond Girls in this one, Andy. So this one should be quite short because there's not really much to talk about compared to A View to a Kill where obviously we had a, a few more. So we've got Cara and Linda. So Andy, with this one, I I struggled a little bit because I start off with Linda. She's obviously only in it during the, the beginning scene with the yacht. But I do think, you know, she, she has got some good dialogue there. But for me, it doesn't push her that high. So she goes in at number 50 out of 55. So that's just above Log Cabin Girl, that is. Now... Kara was a bit difficult, Andy, because as you know, we've mentioned before, the way that I work it is either start from top or bottom and then literally put her in and then start moving her up or down depending on where I start that week. And for me, I, I struggled here because I was thinking, ah, oh, she, so I don't think she was as good as Fiona in Thunderball. But then I think she's probably slightly better. I think that she's probably slightly better than Andrea Anders in The Man with the Golden Gun. So I've put her in a, in a respectable 20th 
So I don't think she's the, the strongest, but she isn't the weakest. But I think, like you've touched on Andy, she, she, you know, she's supposed to be in love with Koskoff, but then she falls for Bond, but she falls for Bond quite quickly. So that does put me off a bit. So a respectable 20th. What about you? That's enough of my rambling on. Where did you put Cara and Linda? I was not a fan of Cara. I know she was the main Bond girl of the film, but it, it she didn't she didn't have the right aura, didn't have the right presentation. There was that you know we talked about the inconsistency and the dynamic between the two just felt all wrong, and so I wasn't a fan at all. Um, so we've got fifty five in the list. Cara comes in at thirty nine for me, just below Mademoiselle de Porte and just above Miss Caruso. Just yeah didn't do it for me at all and linda bit part player no real input other than the, the one scene where she you know for lack of a better term she's just there as eye candy um, so she comes in at 48 nothing nothing really to her part she just she's there yeah and i think this i don't without going through the whole list andy i think we've said before there's usually one standout Bond girl, isn't there? And then there's a couple of kind of supporting Bond girls, whereas this film, it didn't feel like there was a standout. I agree. I agree completely. She was clearly the main Bond girl, but n she did nothing to stand out, I think is, is why I rate in solo. Let's, let's move on to the theme song. So Aha provided the song The Living Daylights, or the film of the same name solid effort good song not quite up to the level of what we've seen recently uh, so for that reason i've got it in at number seven just below for your eyes only by sheena easton and just above you only live twice by nancy sinatra so solid mid table position a good song though what about you jay yeah i do like this song andy and again i struggled with this one this did involved me listening to the the rating room spotify playlist that you pulled together and i was listening to this one back to back with for your eyes only because i couldn't quite place so for your eyes only is number four and i'll put living daylights in at number five but i had to listen to both the songs back to back a few times to think oh does it warrant going in number four for because for me at the moment a view to a kill by duran duran is out there and then I've got Diamonds Are Forever and Goldfinger are very close, number two and three. And then it drops down to For Your Eyes Only. But then I, I did think For Your Eyes Only is a better better song. I enjoyed listening to that one a bit more, even though The Living Daylights is quite different to the other kind of songs that we've had. I know it's similar to Duran Duran, but there's a new, bit of a new direction. So I do like how they mixed it up. So a respectable fifth position for... Aha. Uh -huh. So moving on, we've got the opening credits. And obviously I mentioned earlier on at the, the top of the podcast what was included. So I'm not going to go over that again. So I'm just going to say Living Daylight goes in at number six. So again, I think, you know, it's out of the 15 films that is just above midpoint. But for me, it doesn't warrant anything better than sixth place. Um, it was slightly above A View to a Kill, which obviously was last week's episode, so that's in number eight. So a respectable sixth position, Andy, for me. What about you, Andy? Where where does it fit with you? Uh, for me, I was a little bit disappointed by it. You know, there's there's nothing to make it stand out from anything else. Um, it's, it's, again, going back to what I've said about previous ones, it was feeling a bit laboured, a bit lazy. Um, so I've got it in at number 10, uh, just above Diamonds Are Forever, just below For Your Eyes Only. It was kind of, it was it was a bit paint by numbers for me, just nothing special at all. It'd be interesting to see, Andy, because obviously you mentioned at the big, um, earlier on in the podcast that Marie's Binder as, you know, this is the last time. So let's see where License to Kill comes in with someone different. Yeah, I'm trying to think if there will be a marked change in direction because from the top of my head I can't really remember so I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to see where it goes from here uh, moving on to villains 
we've got three villains in of the piece here. We've got Koskov, we've got Whitaker, and we've got Necros. And for my rankings, I've got those three in that order, spread out amongst the, the table. Now, not a lot to choose between any of them, really, and on the whole, I would say, slightly disappointing. No, no real strong antagonists. Um, and, and maybe this is another contributing factor to the rating that I gave it, but for me, for me all three were somewhat disappointing. So we've got 45 villains in total now. I've got Koskov in at 27, just above Scaramanga. I've got Whitaker in at 32, just below Blofeld from Thunderball and just above Dr. Mortner from A View to a Kill. And Necros in at 35, just below Emilio Leopold Locke. Also all there or thereabouts, but bottom half of the table. Just, yeah, not the strongest villains by any means. Uh, do you agree or disagree with that assessment? I totally agree with you, Andy. And I don't know what you thought of when you saw my rankings. And listeners, once they see the rankings on our website or social medias, you might be thinking, Jay, you're just being lazy this week. And I'm not, because I'll put in put them in 26th, 27th, and 28th. So they're not spread out at all. But exactly for the point that Andy just mentioned, there was very little between them. And honestly, for me, they could have gone in any order, but all grouped together. They they just didn't do it for me. Especially Koskoff, because he there's bits in the film, Andy, and I can't remember exactly the scenes, but it's like where he goes, oh, James. And he's like trying to give James a hug and everything. And he's just really over familiar. And I think he's probably trying to play a character that he's, um, innocent and he, you know nothing to be worried about type of person but all that how he acts is just like really weak and it was just really annoying but then Brad Whitaker I just don't think that's a good character as well so Nick Ross could have been at the top three but because he's a henchman and he's being led by the other two that's why I don't think he wants to be above the other two so for me, I couldn't separate them. And that's why I put them in at 26th, 27th, or 28th. If there were stronger villains in this film, I think that would have pushed the film up by one or two points as well. If they had a, a stronger Bond girl, a stronger primary villain, you could, you know, Nick, Nick Ross would be fine in there. But if they had a villain that was easily in our top 10, 15, for me, that probably would have pushed it up to a, a seven. And if they had a different Bond girl, this might be being a bit harsh. That could have been started pushing it to eight with the, the grittier theme of the Bond film. But it was just let down by the Bond girl and the the villains for me. Yeah, hard to argue that. I think they're all contributing factors. And when you put them all together, that's what leads to the decisions and the rankings that we've come up with. Yeah, and... Our villains, you know, we do have a bit of um, difference, but our villains are not as much as Bond gals, but our villains are largely around the similar places, aren't they, really? So moving on now, so the movies, obviously at the top of the podcast, we we went into a bit more in depth, didn't we, than we usually do at the beginning, so I'm not going to go much deeper here. So I gave Living Daylight 6 out of 10, and... As we've said before, you know, we're not having joint positions in the movies. So on my list, Live and Let Die as six out of ten. You only live twice and Octopussy both as six out of ten. So the Living Daylights comes in at six out of ten. So where did I put Living Daylights? And for me, it was the weaker out of the the other films I just mentioned. So Living Daylights goes in at number eleven. So that is one position and one point above diamonds are forever so out of the 15 films so far I put living daylights in at 11. andy where did you put the living daylights so the five out of ten put this in the same territory as diamonds are forever and the man with a golden gun for me and i've decided that they are that living daylights is sandwiched between the two so it comes in at number 13 of 15 just to just above the man with the golden gun, just below diamonds are forever. And, and I, you know, 
I won't want to labour the point, but this could have been very, very high up the list had it continued as it started. But it, it went downhill quite quickly for me. And everything we've mentioned in terms of the the acting, the Bond girls, the villains, all, have all contributed to its downfall. So it's it's third bottom as things stand. Now, in terms of obviously movies by actor, it's the first one of Dalton, so by default goes into first place for the Dalton films. And there's obviously only two to choose from, so so next week we'll figure out whether it is top or bottom. Yeah, there's, there's not much really to say, like Andy said. So I'm going to move on to Bond actors. So this is nice. We've got a new Bond actor now, because obviously we've had Roger Moore for seven weeks on the trot, and he never stayed, um, he never moved from his second position when we watched the film, so he was consistently in second place. So, Timothy Dalton, where does he come in? So, we've had four actors so far play Timothy Dalton, and I've put Timothy Dalton in at number four out of four. And for me, the, you know, the film wasn't great. As I said, the Bond girl, girls wasn't great, the village wasn't great. Whereas Jules Lazenby, I've even though it's totally different in terms of how they portrayed James Bond, Honor Majesty's Secret Service is such a good film that I think it's hard to put Timothy Dalton above Jules Lazenby at the moment, especially on a one film showing. That might change next week when we watch License to Kill. But for me, it comes in at fourth, so bottom of the pile so far. Andy? I have to agree. And I'm just looking back at our predetermined rankings I had Dalton and Lazenby the other way around but I think upon reflection of watching both of those films back recently Lazenby's performance was stronger than Dalton's and although he took it in a very different direction to Connery he was at least consistent it was a very defined approach that he took whereas Dalton for me on on the evidence of this one film alone hasn't really found his identity as Bond it seems to be going in too many different directions he needs to needs to settle on a direction and, and go with it too too inconsistent for me so he's currently bottom of the pile that's it really Andy in terms of our rankings do you want to say anything before we um, sign off uh, I'm, I'm not going to end with anything funny or witty at this stage uh, I just want to give you a, a statistic and that is, up to now, James Bond has killed 180 people. That is a stat. But only next week is he finally going to get his license to kill. Thanks for listening, everyone. When it comes to talking sports, they're the authority. Locked up sports. Whether you're a diehard fan or just a casual observer, we guarantee you'll enjoy our show. It's like saying no. you're a sanitation no, engineer, no. but you're a janitor. We'll take a little, uh, hey, a couple minutes off from Bob anytime. <laughs> 50 percent of me is better than 100 percent of a lot of people. <laughs> That's, uh, Just ask my wife. Uh, put then, that one in the vault. Bob Walters and Brett Grosso break down the New York teams like nobody else can. The Jets are four and two. Four and two. The Giants are five and one. We have good football teams again. Where's they don't need McCaffrey now. And to be honest with you, what McCaffrey's not going to be the player. He's never going to be the player he was. Trades, this they very, very rarely affect the line. Playing the Chiefs. Full point change because McCaffrey goes that direction. We can get Scherzer for a, a, a two-hit shutout in July. We got Scherzer for Friday night. What a disaster that was. Let Locked Up Sports be your go-to source for sports talk. Listen anytime, wherever you get your podcast. New episodes drop every Friday night. Well, that's this week's episode done. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to the band Sugar Tongue for the theme tune to The Rating Room. You can find them on all the usual social media channels. And be sure to check out their song The System, available now on Spotify. You can find and message us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram by searching The Rating Room. You'll find all our social media links on our website, theratingroom.com, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or feel free to drop us an email at theratingroom at gmail.com. Goodbye, thanks for listening. And we'll see you next week, right here on The Rating Room. Mm-hmm.